This is going to be another episode of Summoning in Faith with me and Monty here on Last Free Nation, which is a network where we put content out and it has other shows like Power Spike, which, by the way, I can update you. I don't actually watch these shows, but I just do a Monty watch. He wasn't on that one. You might always <laughs> on that one again. They brought him back. They had a whole thing there <laughs> with them and Dom. Um, obviously, we have the Monty and Wolf show, which... Look, at the moment, it's just Monty and Wolf. Probably be Yamato and Wolf at one point in time, I assume, at this point, where things are going, you know. Uh, the real uh, question is, when is Yamato yeah. taking over for me on Summoning Inside? <laughs> okay. Indeed. Um, no, Yamato and I are just going to switch off uh, over on Power Spike. We also have a new show, The Sackdown, with Yamato and oh, Dom, yes. yep. uh, where we got a very spicy episode with Perks talking about his career. So if you guys haven't seen that, check it out on our channels. Uh, it's, I'm sure you guys have seen it because it's like popping off. Um, it's got lots of fire in it, by the way. The only thing is, though, the reason why Perks is the ideal first guest is like, as someone who's got a lot of experience doing shows, Monty, I don't just listen to what they're saying. I'm also thinking about like what the show's looking like. So, all you need to know is, I think the first answer answer he gives Monty, he just talks for about half an hour while they just like sit there, like really, and then he's just telling like his whole story. So, like, he's probably the perfect guest to just regale you with a tale and a tavern, as it were. You know, so it's pretty good. There's some good spicy stuff in there for sure. Yeah, exactly. I enjoyed um, it. <laughs> so. Despite not watching our shows, Thorin did admit that he watched that show. I watched that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally I just understandable. Don't have time for the others, usually. Of course, of course. Uh, you can check out the Counter Strike shows going strong over on the Counter Strike channel. Thorin has an NBA show with Maui Snake called Banter Give and Go. Uh, we have our Culture channel. You can subscribe to all of these things. Uh, well, what, what do we got going on? Culture oh, by channel. By the way, one of the best on the Culture channel, on our four player series with Richard Lewis, where we do the movie reviews, we've got probably the funniest one coming up because <laughs> the premise of it was it's called Spit Roast. The idea is each person had to pick a film they think the others don't like. Or in theory, we agreed, like they haven't seen it or they don't like it. And then the idea is it's intentionally a roast session. Like the other two people in theory are probably going to be like, that movie is shit for reasons X, Y, and Z. And then the clever thing. Thing is is the gimmick after we do each three of the three of us doing our own indulgent pick at the end we like all unite forces like the avengers to destroy the one true evil which is roger ebert and we picked out one of the most shittest roger ebert full star four out of four star reviews is the movie 500 days of summer and we're just going to absolutely eviscerate that like i have purposely not even watched it yet. i'm going to wait until right before we do it because i want it to be fresh in the mind because that that movie is horrific so that one's going to be really funny for that way that's less of like yeah. a watch because he's a great movie He's a modge watch for entertainment value at that point, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the first one in that series, 13th Warrior, will come out this week. So that 13th Warrior was my movie that I liked, that I picked, that <laughs> Thorin and, and Richard did indeed hate. Uh, so it started out well. Uh, but you guys can have, head on over to Last Free Nation Culture or look up for play on the podcasting platform of your choice. Uh, so thank you very much. Go ahead and subscribe to our channels. We do have some spicy stuff to get into today because we can't have a week without something really stupid happening at riot it's just the way of things thor and so in a absolutely well, good news is this has nothing to do with saudi so if you're thinking oh bloody <laughs> well, fatigue monty please like in theory this is just about riot it? <laughs> overtly at least overtly. Let, let's i mean say, look spoiler all roads lead to riyadh in the end buddy. but this is more of like a you know this is more of the piece along the way that doesn't have the dot connected necessarily i i, I, w I will say that the timing of this is suspicious when we assume that uh, Riot is just inching, inching closer into the warm embrace of Saudi Arabia. And so I'm not saying it's not connected. I can't definitely say that. But it is very funny that we talked about this on the show previously when the sabbatical happened. But Naz Alataha, who was the head of Glo global LOL esports, has now officially said that she is leaving the company basically she's gonna stay on for a few more months help a transition to the new person who will be taking her responsibilities who is chris greeley who i'm sure you all know and love uh and which itself <laughs> becomes interesting in light of certain of stories that we'll talk so about funny. past weeks you know <laughs> uh because True. he was he was actually just apparently doing her job for her this entire time so riot has instituted a sabbatical program where you can just 
leave your job it's and not, not work pop. and still get paid, I guess. It's uh, pop, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of an abuse. Basically, the short version is she basically took the year off. Then right when she's come back from the year off, she's like, actually, I'm just quitting anyway. It's like, yes. <laughs> oh, what's this? That's why if you saw Monty, I used, even though everyone's overused that meme, I used that perfect one of that me anime meme, you know, where that guy appears in that cloak, like my, oh, my work is done or something. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, you didn't even do anything. He's like, that's what it feels like. Where was she the last year and a half? She's doing fucking nothing. Like, anyway, I've got to go now. Like, what were you doing? What were you even doing though? It's so bad, isn't it? I love it. I love how I, well, I love it. It's just how stupid it all is, as usual. It, it, so it is funny. By the way, you know, I, I love, as usual, Riot loves to abuse language. So when they say sabbatical, as far as I can tell, they literally just mean take time off and do nothing, which is not the way sabbatical is used historically in jobs with sabbaticals. For example, my father is a scientist and he's a university professor. And when he took sabbaticals, what that meant was traveling to a different institution to do scientific research and like, teach classes so it's a okay. it's it's a break from perhaps your normal day-to-day -day routine you routine you take a year you go off somewhere else you'd still do work like let's be really clear but you focus on that research obviously you still get paid and then you come back so it's a way for uh university professors to actually interact or intermingle with each other around the world um it's one of the reasons why I was a kid. I lived in Germany for a year, for example, because my father had a had a sabbatical at the University of Heidelberg there. So this is all to say that I think Riot is abusing the actual concept of sabbatical. Maybe she was doing something else. Who who can actually know? But it was very funny because when this happened a year ago, we mentioned it on this show. It was she is leaving literally as the shit is hitting the fan in. It, oh, the timing was very winter. cynical when it was she so scheduled funny. her sabbatical, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like, maybe I should stick around to, I don't know, steer the ship of global LOL esports through this storm. Uh, you know, under normal circumstances, I probably could have left. But now's definitely the time. And then now she, of course, because the storm has not really subsided and they're changing everything now. She's got she's got to peace out forever now, which, you know, I will not have any love lost for her. We'll get into kind of the history of LOL Esports, I think, and dive into the contributions that were made specifically by her over the years, which have been, in my opinion, quite negligible. Um, but, you know, it is super funny that basically just quitting when times got hard, just literally taking money for a year well, and, and, also and then quitting your gig. Here's another one, Monty. And I'm getting really sick and tired of this now, mate. Why are we treating X.com and Reddit like they are the official LOL Wiesmots website? What are we doing right now? Like, why is her post, Monty, leaving her position at, as, like, head of Riot Global? Why is that just not on LOL Esports? Why is it a really long fucking Twitter post? What is this? Like, bro, why is our industry so bad? Why is that not just like an official post? Like, what am I missing? Why do we not do official posts anymore on the live websites? Like, it's what they're for. Uh, well, because then we eventually have to take them down when we make partnerships with the Saudi government, right? When we make a post about Neom and it's really official and it's on the site, it becomes a problem potentially later on. They also, you know, I think don't want to alert uh, potentially their global partners that this that, is that, going that on. That sounds plausible. Yeah. Um, you know, that that definitely they may not want to be making this a super big deal because I yep. think what they're trying to do is like pass off her responsibilities to somebody else and say, oh, well, this person was already doing that job anyway. So no need to worry about anything, guys, because here's the thing, Thorne. I know when she declared her sab sabbatical in the first place, the team owners were not happy. Right. It's like, wait, what the it's fuck now? You're leaving I mean, now? Story, if you give the analogy before, Monty, of steering a ship, well, in this analogy, the ship's taken on water. We need all hands on fucking <laughs> yes. deck. We can't just go and, I'll just be off on that island over there for a year. Like, we can't do it's that. It's like the I'll, Titanic like, sinking into the, it. and the know. captain's off in a lifeboat. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. With a glass of champagne. It, it was just completely ridiculous. Um, but I will say, like, you know, this this just ties into, I think, a larger problem because she has been at Riot for over a decade right now. And in general, LOL Esports she has... She in 2012, Matt. Yeah, she, she is part of a crew. And Riot in general, but in particular, League of Legends and Riot Esports have really loved promoting from within. Like, there's there haven't been a lot of 
outside hires. And usually when they have a vacancy, they promote somebody to fill that vacancy rather than getting somebody new to do that. And, you know, this has been going on basically since the beginning. But you have to understand how Riot's esports department started, which was nepotism. Right. It was pure nepotism. And it was started because Brandon Beck, who was then he was the CEO of Riot. He was he decided that his 20, I think, 27 year old brother at the time, Dustin Beck, who is a man with no sports experience, no sports experience. (laughs) Yeah. Ginger guy uh, comes in and is suddenly the vice president of esports. Okay. So what happened then is Dustin Beck makes a variety of hires. Of course, none of these people, even at the time, so in 2011, in 2012, when this was going on, there were people who were very qualified to be an esports position, endemic people from the industry. Remember, at this point in time, ESL had been around for, what, over a decade, around a decade? There had been tons of people over there. Riot chose to ignore all of the endemic people from the industry, many of them who had already been working for 10 plus years, been team owners in the past, et cetera, et cetera, um, had really good executive experience in the case of many people at ESL, uh, who still work there, by the way, Uh, people at MLG. I mean, you, you pick it. They ignored it. Uh, And instead, basically, the people that were hired were kind of um, bootlickers for Dustin Beck. And a lot of these people have now been promoted into executive positions within Riot, but they were never really from the industry. And this is where a lot of the ideas of, hey, you know what? We have all this traditional sports. We were it's not even they're from traditional sports. They're literally just fans of traditional sports and that's where we got a lot of the really terrible ideas when it comes to format production operation of the circuit taking it internal because you also have to remember that these people justify their existence by basically kill they they justify their existence by killing the third party circuit because the more internal esports was to riot the more control these people had uh, and the more power they got so it Every action was basically justified to bring it internal, which is slowly, obviously, now being reversed because they're suddenly saying, hey, we really want to do more third party events like we used to inexplicably. Right. Uh, Totally inexplicably. And I think there were some positive things, at least in the early days, because what is fair to say about Riot is in the early days of LCS and EU NA and EU LCS is that there wasn't a third party tournament operator who would have brought the same level of quality. I think that is entirely fair to say. There's, there's a, absolutely no way they would. In the West. One thing I'll say is this. I actually think the problem Riot has when we address this topic is that if you look at their era when they did take over LCS 2013, that was the era when they were just putting in so much more money than an ESL would have spent, Monty, to yes. do the same project. That like they actually were quality wise. I agree. It was way better. And obviously, they paid the teams way more and pumped all the sure. salaries up and uh, the, the studio things were way better than they would have. No, that's that's totally true. It's just obviously the problem becomes fans won't know this, but years later, people like ESL did get to that level and did have that amount of investment themselves. So eventually, so, there was a time where they would have been overtaken and they probably should have given it up. But I agree. In the early days, you have to give it to Riot. Like they did put a lot of money in, and it was a big reason why League of Legends especially but, leveled up in the early days. Yeah. But they but also, yeah. you know, Thorin, the 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 counter side to that argument is that they didn't have to do it themselves. So, for example, when I was working for OGN, which was operated by a third party and was better than anything Riot was putting out product wise. They were paying about 50% of the production costs, Riot, of what it costs to make League of Legends tournaments in Korea. And then OGN and their parent company, CJ, were getting sponsorships or paying for the other 50%. So, you know, the thing about it, Thorin, is like, sure, they did lean on ESL in the early days of, of EU LCS, but they could have provided team subsidies. They could have actually provided third-party tournament operators, you know, paid them money in order to run this as well. And with the same amount of money they were spending, if it had been injected into partnerships or other companies, we don't know what the end result of that would have been. But regardless, like you can say in the early days of EU and NALCS, it was a pretty big uh, upgrade in terms of quality compared to MLG or ESL at the time in which it was made, right? Over time, I think those, those expenses became, you know, it, the difference the gap really closed in a lot of ways, especially in the West, but they were, I, you know, to their credit, they were critical in spending that money and creating those broadcasts. What I, what I will say though, is that NASA's early job was as 
basically operating, you know, commercial partnerships and sponsorships, right? And one of the things that was super hilarious about when League of Legends, particularly in North America, was peaking in 2015 and 2016 was that they really didn't have very many sponsors, right? And what they would, what Riot would always say internally was they say, when, when the teams, including me, who owned a team, would ask them questions such as, well, why don't you guys get some sponsors? They would say, ha, 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 we don't want to be NASCAR, basically implying that they didn't want corporate logos over everything. This being the same company who now has, by the way, and with the same people making those decisions who said that quote, oh, well, now we have the Red Bull Power Play and we've had the Bud Light Ace. And like, the way, obviously that, they that did take, NASCARify it hugely. Of course. No, the reason that take was always destined, even the second it was uttered, to be so poorly like thought out and constructed as a premise is because that only works, Monty, if you think of the Riot League of Legends esports as they did at the time, which is like this, almost like this is just a small marketing exercise we do, but the big game is the real reason we do this is just League of Legends the game. And in fact, what you're almost doing back then is you treat it like you'll never be the main thing. You're just esports, this side thing, which is all well and good if you have the money to bankroll it for yourself but the reason why that was such a poorly thought out statement is one as you see now when they no longer want to bankroll you look fucking stupid because what you're basically saying Monty, is i actively <laughs> turned down sponsors so yeah. you sound like an idiot and then secondly in an industry where even the sponsorship can't fund everything now it's just a really badly aged take isn't it like you look back now and you would beg any of those companies to come in in fact some of those companies that would have come in then now won't come in at this point so you've also missed your chance on that one so it now just sounds really silly but it's indicative of how they thought about esports back then for sure well i mean what was funny is like when i was there in meetings where they were discussing this ownership meetings at riot um you know a, a lot of the talk was where are the sponsors and that this is how they would laugh it off and naz was the person who was supposed to be doing that but they said like oh we don't want to do that it should be about the game we don't want to be nascar we don't want to have sponsorships everywhere and then they actually just went ahead and sold those anyway so it just showed it was kind of a cover for their own incompetence and inability to sell sponsors but they also did miss basically the peak of viewership when it came to actually activating these sponsors and there were to to be fair there were sponsors that came along later but I was, and my team, Renegades, was represented by WME, which is one of the biggest agencies in Hollywood. And remember that Riot is located in Los Angeles. And I had agents from WME with me at some of these Riot meetings. And they basically came up to me after they were with me in these meetings and said, what the hell is Riot doing? Why don't they get a real agency to represent them? Because they didn't actually have that at the time. And so the, they weren't even trying in a city that has some of the largest entertainment agencies in the world to partner with them in order to get sponsorships done. I mean, it was it was frankly like these agents were, were like appalled and like extremely surprised about the size of this esports league LCS and the lack of sales that were going on. Now, later there were some partnerships. We saw like the Louis Vuitton deal that came through, but was that 2019, I believe. And oh, it was years and years. Into yeah, it. yeah, that was, that was a deal that was looked really shiny on paper and we got the Kiana skin, uh, but it never came back is the thing. Like it was a very short lived deal. Um, and we have seen big global partnerships. However, partnerships like Red Bull, uh, Red Bull is much more interested in access to the IP and the ability to do things like the Red Bull Arena in the offseason than they are in actually sponsoring the esports leagues. Um, and so their esports sponsorship is kind of just incidental for them to get what they actually want, which is the ability to kind of run these events with fans and also with the professional teams. Um, and they love these live activations. You have MasterCard who has re-upped, right, for many years. We, we've we had uh, Mercedes, who's been a, a big uh, part of the World Championship International events. So there have been some of these deals that have come through, and I'm sure Naz played a role in that. But on the whole, like, the the whole the whole history of sales in lol esports has been really underwhelming i mean don't even get into the media rights side of things right but the sponsorship really missed the peak and even today the sponsorships are way down we've seen lots of sponsors of major american corporations pull out of leagues like the lcs bud light isn't there anymore state farm isn't there anymore um and there haven't been a lot of other deals that have replaced these at any kind of of scale um so it's you know, it's, I would say, not 
not a huge loss in the end to be shedding some of these executives who were promoted from within, but in my mind, without significant merit uh, to those promotions and were not really instrumental in building anything long lasting. And indeed, I look at what has happened with League of Legends esports, and the only thing I can think of is, well, if you had spent this money to work with partners and had a third party circuit, we probably would have been doing better than we are right now. Uh, because everything is fucking on fire right now, guys. Like a lot of the a lot of the teams are going to see their their stipends like actually decrease next year. Um, there is a contraction in terms of what Riot is doing. They're cutting teams. They're cutting, as we know from their roadmap, they're cutting entire like basically uh, endemic scenes. Right? They're trying to roll everybody into the Pacific region. CB Laws get is allegedly they're planning to have it merged with LCS into the the kind of two division system of north and south. Uh these are uh these are like massive changes but it is reversing the plan of them having all of these local leagues. Like they have been cutting down on the number of local leagues forever for years now and consolidating them into kind of like combined leagues or adding Turkey to like EU masters and these kind of things. So really the plan has failed if we're being honest. And now we're having to undo all of the domestic, the local domestic leagues that are not tier one regions that we had previously. So it's not great. And then when we talk about Chris Greeley, who's the, the guy who's replacing him, he actually presided over the LCS when it was probably product wise, the worst it ever was. Yep. Like it was a complete garbage product when this guy was commissioner, and if we take even though the, that was the era, Monty, where in theory it was the most money in League of Legends, like you actually could have done the most in that period. Well, it was also the pandemic, and there are certain problems associated with that. But at the same time, if you guys remember the incredibly cringe Alienware dome idea that they tried to pull off as a sponsorship, like the product was incredibly out of touch with its fan base, and I think. You know, just pick what a commissioner is, because if a commissioner is the product guy like we have with Mark Z right now, I think Mark Z is is doing a good job on revitalizing the product. But if that's the case and it always was a product job, the question is, why was it so fucking terrible previously? Why were all of these horrible decisions being made? Why were we dealing with broadcast talent where there's like 10 different analysts on this broadcast that were just swapping out willy nilly? Why is there nothing interesting happening within the broadcast itself? Why is production going down the tubes? Why is it boring? You know what I mean? And this is when LEC was absolutely smashing them and they were not taking any notes from LEC whatsoever. And also this is when Viewership was actually going up because of the pandemic, guys. When people couldn't go outside and this was free entertainment, esports viewership went up and the product was miserable. It was miserable during this era. So I wouldn't have a lot of confidence uh, that this is going to get any better uh, over time because it's like, again, you can't, you actually just can't find them hiring somebody from the outside to do the job or mixing it up with unique ideas. It always has to be somebody frequently who has not done a very good job within Riot and obviously hasn't done a good job because the product is bad, right? And what they're putting out is bad and they're not doing the sales and they're losing sponsors. And now all of a sudden that person is in a higher position of power. It's outrageous. It's crazy. This is also why the key thing that you pointed out is that they came from Riot Games, all these people. These people were nobodies who just got promoted through the system. By the way, already, I tell you a terrible red flag right there. That implies to me the higher-ups want their original hires to be their top hires so they can brag about how what geniuses they are with their eye. And like, oh, look at the person I scouted and I brought him up and I developed him, which is already like, you just don't do that. As you said, Monty, people like ESL have done this many times. If you have the option to take someone from the real world of like a sport that does what you want to do one day, you just take that guy if that exec wants to come and join of course you bring him in like he's going to know and have connections you'll never have as a pleb from the industry the difference with Riot is they are so absolutely self-centered and indulgent they will put someone who used to just be a kid with a red shirt like an event like hey we're Riot like five years ago they'll put that person in a room with like you know head of fucking marketing budget at a giant company and go have at it and, and I, I can't even imagine what those people 
people are thinking. I'm sure everyone here, as, a, as an appeal to the plebs out there, surely you've seen the show Mad Men, right, guys? Right? In the show Mad Men, you already understand how essential, like, social proof is knowing the person, you having it in, them being able to recommend you, you having past work, you having a reputation. If you just put some idiot in a room with someone, they're going to fuck it up already. And it's just insulting. Like, why are you sending me the equivalent of what used to be your intern to now negotiate a giant deal? Like, why, why are you bringing me someone who used to work for, like, the NBA or they worked, you know, even if it, by the way, even if it's esports, maybe they worked for ESL for 10 years and did sales but, and did but, things around the world. Like, this would be the obvious way you'd do here's, it. Here's the outrageous thing, Thor. To my knowledge, there is not a single person on Riot Esports executive team who actually is an OG esports person or comes from traditional sports. I don't think yes. either of those things are represented. We are not seeing people who have 20 years of esports experience as executives at Riot. Like, how is it possible that their entire executive team can have none of these people? I mean, the, the answer is, is because they do culture fit. And if you were from one of these industries, you would probably be not really happy with the way that they're doing things because I know basically nobody who has been in this industry for multiple decades outside of Riot who thinks what Riot is doing is the smart or best way to do things. And if you actually prove that you are correct, it then makes all of those people who have spent the last five years of their lives derping around on these projects look bad. And then, then what happens, right? And a lot of this too is like the right. constant focus at Riot. Well, we have to keep things internal. We have to keep things internal. We uh, It all has to be internal all the time because they can't be proven wrong. And if somebody else does it better, if you were to give the license to a third party and they were to do a better job, what is the justification for you to continue to have work, right? And especially I'd because a lot of these people well. are just massively overpaid relative to the actual value they're producing. I'd also say as well, the culture fit angle is the other reason why you will never get a reasonable funnel of talent into Riot. Because as nope. you say, with the approach they take, it wouldn't work on either side, Monty. It wouldn't work for the person who's actually an OG, who, who has like value in what they've done, because that person wouldn't be able to handle working within Riot, because Riot has also done something which is so fucking stupid, which is they kept the esports division very much part of Riot culture. And so you're not even getting to, as you do in esports, one of the best things about esports Sports is the idea that you're in like a burgeoning field. So you get to have a lot of agency. You get to do your ideas. You get to be a visionary. You get to do new things. Well, you can't do that when you're trapped in a smothering American corporate culture, like the literal stereotype of like the annoying HR woman and the boss calling a million meetings. And then you have to go through 700 interviews. It's, it's everything you wouldn't want. It's everything about the real world of corporate culture that no one wants in esports. And then also, Monty, that's from the side of the talent. Here's why on the riot side, it wouldn't work if they joined anywhere. Because they, when they say culture fit, guys, they actually mean it quite literally. As in you as in you have to basically be like, it's like the NPC meme. They have to put that hand on your shoulder and go, one of us. One, and then you just gray out from the human into the NPC. <laughs> yes, I am one of us. Because basically, when they do those million interviews, you've heard us tell the stories about people like D-Man failing, where you have to get through a million like vibe checks before you're allowed into the inner sanctum, as it were. Well, the problem with that is, in the modern day, because Riot's corporate culture is so poisonous and stupid like inherently stupid in all the worst american ways like what's it what's cancer about riot guys is they managed to actually combine a stupid late to 90s early 2000s frat boy at, at, at atmosphere with the nightmare blue haired cat lady hr woman who wants to ruin everyone's life like what sort of insane being dragged like that's like fucking that thing of like you know what's like two parents dragged apart it's like this is what divorced us the kids and you fall between into that cat that's what a nightmare that must be. So also in the same way, Monty is in the modern day politically. If you have like you know a family and you love your kids, you're like an ex a right wing extremist, right? In the same way, if you actually were good, you'd never be able to join Riot. Like they would. By the way, everything that would be great about the person joining from ESL or whatever, or from uh, or esports org or something, would be they would say stuff like, "Oh, you just like you're selfish, or you have you don't you don't fit our vi our vision. You don't see you know they'd have all this like fucking euphemistic way to explain away what would actually be good." about you joining and then i actually agree with you the biggest problem is an obvious one because it's actually the reason why look there's a bigger conspiracy when it comes to media which is i actually do think they're trying to like invert people's like 
priorities and um, principles in society and what they value and what they don't so that they can do certain things in, in the makeup of the world. But I actually think the literal nuts and bolts ways they implement that is when they do shows, like all the ones you guys roast on Nerd Legion, like fucking bad Star Wars shows and bad Star Trek shows, the actual reason those shows suck inherently is because the people they hire... Obviously, if you even interviewed these people, bro, before they ever made one episode, you'd know they'd never succeed. Like, you can tell this guy doesn't get it. Like, even their idea, like, the joke of modern Star Wars, it's like the famous thing people always said about why The Simpsons became shit. Because eventually, it just became written by people who were fans of The Simpsons. And so they weren't Monty sitting down going, I'm a comedy writer with some funny ideas. How will I make it fit into The Simpsons? They were sitting down going, oh, boy, I'm so glad I get to write The Simpsons. Here's what I like about The Simpsons. And I'm going to do it. And if you do that, it becomes, like, inherently, like overly self-referential sure. and yep. you lose the point of it. And so similarly, I'd say the same thing. The two angles where they lost the plot completely is I don't believe they've ever had someone do this role that this Naz person did and Chris Greeley, etc., or John Needham. No one's ever done those roles for my money who ever got esports. Like you say, they yep. weren't people from esports. So that's a nightmare already. They don't have the grounding. Their only basis in esports is Riot Games esports. So they also come from the cult. And so they all think the same way. Like there's two mistakes they made. In the early days, you know this, idiots like Dust Beck just did the NFL approach, which was just like, hey, basically, I don't actually want to do a bloody kid's rip off of daughter. I wish I was just doing the NFL. So you know what? Let's just do the NFL. And you put in all these things where what you missed was that's not even in the NFL because it's the best. It's in the NFL because they have things like logistical impossibility of playing a best of seven. They can't like go around the world. They all these factors that like basically weren't real restrictions. They were restrictions on the physical sport of American football. So you missed it with the NFL thing because you never were going to be the NFL and also that. That's aged poorly because the NFL's viewership goes down and gets older every year, you morons. And then the other angle, and this is the worst thing, is to save it all, Monty. This is how you know none of these people are real esports people. To save it, the pivot wasn't, let's finally get rid of that NFL bullshit and just do esports. No, the pivot, do you remember, was let's get like Soup Dragon and the Queen Cutie Pie, whatever the, whoever the fuck these people, essentially that was like the worst boomer moment I've ever seen. That's like a guy <laughs> in a room went, what are these kids like? Like fucking Twitch streams and bloody Fortnite. Get me those Twitch streamers. They love them, don't they? And they really did it, bro. Like, like the joke is at this point, Tyler Watt at least comes from bloody League of Legends. Like, that's a whack. That, and then they did a whole era where for me, Monty, that era actually is just straight up like children's TV programming. That was embarrassing. <laughs> that was like, that short Monty would have died on its ass on MTV in the 90s. That was like little kid <laughs> shit. You know what I mean? Like those interviews, those silly features. Oh, it was fucking garbage, man. Like, whose idea well, was that? It was just bad. I mean, it's it's also bad that, state of you know, like John Needham uh, comes from game publishing. And so he was actually in the publishing wing of Riot prior to being in the esports wing. So what happens is like these people drink the Riot Kool Aid, and then they get in, and then they get transferred over to esports. But what happens is all the people who have been there with the bad ideas, because the new people or people who are transferring internally don't necessarily know a lot about right about esports are just told by the people who made the bad ideas in the first place that those were actually good ideas and that here's how esports works but they don't have outside experience of esports so they have no clue how to actually double check what is fucking true or not and so they just end up basically the, their their subordinates basically end up puppeteering them into opinions uh, effectively and there's no sanity check because there's nobody from outside in esports who is actually in the executive team or the upper echelons of this company who can give feedback so it's just it's just it's just a circle jerk is what it ends up be becoming um i mean some of the stuff that john needham has said makes me know that he doesn't understand esports because i know that's just an opinion that's been spoon fed to him by other people from within riot esports department even people like mark merrill the old president of the company didn't understand esports we know that because he posted absurd shit on reddit about tsm's business that didn't make any sense at and all the faker stuff all of it yeah, yeah and the faker course, stuff no. and it's like they've never actually had a product person in a position of power at Riot, which yep. you can tell because their products are all By shit. By the way, Monty, 
I'll give you, I'll even give you the olive branch in this discussion to show that I'm not un, unduly biased. I'm always going to be biased, but not unduly, which is, you will know that I don't like Carmack from ESL, right? Because we were rivals when we were journalists and he was rude to me and he's just been a dickhead the whole time he's ever had a chance to. But I'll tell you what, one of the best things they ever did at ESL Monty was hire him to literally be the product manager of the yeah, Intel Extreme Masters. Done. I can tell you, he joined for, I think he joined around season three, maybe just before, maybe it was like end of season two. And I can tell you from the day he walked in the door, they instantly did things like level up all the formats and like the suddenly it went from just being another circuit within esports where everyone used to run those champions. Well, and you'll know this in Counter Strike, basically almost immediately it became the most important major and the de facto world championship player. And that's because Monty he came from actual like Quake and Unreal Tournament and CS and jet real hardcore esports. So what he understood that the others didn't was the kind of thing that's cool. Not even notice I didn't say the dreaded lie. I didn't say what fans at home want because who the fuck knows what that is. The reason why you never do it for fans at home, Monty, is we don't even know they exist. So what you do is you do something that you know is super awesome and makes you and other people who care about the game really enthused and want to watch it because then what you hope is if this is real there will be like if you build it they will come they will follow our lead we will be the taste setters as it were we will show how awesome it is and just like things like UFC they will join us instead of us like saying hey what do you guys want and they're making in this analogy making MMA into boxing or some shit version of that you know instead you do, you do your thing hardcore which is why by the way you need the car back of the hardcore person because you know the saddest thing about this conversation is I can already tell where the Bozo's brain went when you started bringing up this Nazali Alataya thing, which is they'll just think, but who could you have hired? Right. First of all, Monty's literally sat right there. He could have done this job. <laughs> By the way, they even had people back in the day, like the Matt Marcus who came from the yep. industry, at least knew what they were doing. There's always been people. By yep. the way, the obvious names are actually people you know, guys. It would be like Papa Smithy. Oh, <laughs> by, by the way, if Papa Smithy wanted to run like eSports, I'd be in for that. This is a guy who's very open to feedback, has, knows OG eSports, has a hardcore interest, but at the same time, very professional. You know what I mean? There's loads of people, bro. Even the likes of the quick shots, etc. I've always thought this, mate. The real problem with League of Legends esports goes like this. Quickshot doesn't end up ever becoming John Needham. John Needham just gets to coast off what Quickshot did for all those years, and then he never gets to get that gig. If it was actually a healthy company, Quickshot would be in John Needham's position. Yeah, that's I, I mean, that's look, look I, I think you do need people who have run, you know, the, we're talking about the global LOL esports budgets is, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. It is a very serious job. You know what I mean? So, like, I do awesome. think you need somebody older in order to do it effectively, but that doesn't mean for some like, things. What we, but like, where is Ralph Reichardt and all this? Where is, you know, Craig Levine? Like, why didn't Riot go get these executives over at ESL when they could have? And here's another if you guys are wondering, here's you know, another... this Monty, let's be real. One of the things that people don't get is people think we're only joking when we say Riot think they invented esports. You guys don't get what they were like. They really, what they, it wasn't that they think they invented it. They think that for real, here's the analogy, it's the most obvious one. They think esports was the scene at the beginning of 2001 A Space Odyssey and we were just the apes going, yes. <laughs> and they were the monolith. That was League of Legends. And when the monolith came down just to even touch it, Monty, evolved as a level to stop. Yeah. So, I, Dude, dude. <laughs> so they we're in spaceships flying around the world with fake like that's like what they actually think their impact on the industry was guys uh, and that's true because they were actually very rude to people at OGN who knew oh, what the fuck they were doing uh, and like they were they were giant douches to a lot of the people who like were very high up at OGN who definitely had a fuck ton more experience than them um, I mean OGN would laugh to me about it uh, <laughs> you know some of the people over there so it's just like uh, but I, I think I think too one of the really damning things about this is that no one has ever actually left Riot Esports and then gone on to work anywhere else have you noticed that? Interesting isn't it mate? Yeah. Weird right? With that especially <laughs> considering I'm supposed to believe from the job they did Monty they know esports better than anyone they're visionaries yep. yeah, where so are they? What, yeah, what, what, it, what have they done? They just stay there the whole time and like sure you could say before well, they might have been getting paid more or they might have had more opportunities. Here's a real question for you guys. With the Saudi money, how come none of them, how come nobody at the executive level, how come nobody high up on the totem pole has gone to ESL? Isn't that weird? Don't you think with some of the Saudi money that maybe ESL would have gone after, headhunted some of these people? There have been a lot of opportunities. What about Blast? 
You know what I mean? Like, I'll tell you right now, here's something interesting. Well, Nate Danzer, the commissioner of the Overwatch League, was headhunted by Epic Games. It was a huge move when he went over there to run their esports, and then he became, like, their VP of partnerships, right? It was a great job. How come that has literally never happened to somebody in Riot Esports Department? Fucking weird. <laughs> it's super weird. It's almost like they don't have any talent to scout, Bonds. It's, it's almost like, and the, here's the truth, guys, nobody in the industry likes these people. <laughs> By the way, yeah, Loki, nobody thinks they're competent. It's, it's probably more of a Richard Lewis type video, but that if, if someone had the uh, if someone had the time to be asked to do it, it would low key be a banger video if you just did one like where are they now? And you just use LinkedIn to show where all these fuckers ended up because I'll guarantee they're just off in some like market department and some some medium sized publisher or working for Red Bull in some <laughs> again in like the youth marketing division. You know what I mean? There's no way any of them are doing something important, Monty. Even I mean, does, they, does they themselves as like Apple, they presented they were like Apple and Steve Jobs and shit, but they haven't done anything else. I'm with you. I mean, the first mean? the first leader, Dustin Beck, you know, it's weird that do? He, I mean, he went off to follow his dream of working in venture capital. OK, <laughs> no, these people are like I said, this is the esports tourist. This, these are the people that I refer to as they come <laughs> in because esports <laughs> is the hot cynical. You've got to be Monty to ever imply that your dream yes. was to work in venture yeah. capital. That's yeah, you, you know, be like, I'm so glad to fulfill my you know, dream of working here in the accounting department. You know, like, nobody's was, ever said that ever. I don't it was, I love you it. know, Dustin Beck it. was sitting there and he's like. Well, you know what? I, I didn't nepotistically get this job because my brother runs this company and it doesn't matter if I have these credentials. And also the revenue at this com company in 2011 is growing exponentially like Riot is going to the fucking moon in terms of their game. But you know what? I'm going to now's the time to leave, guys. Almost like you got fired for a different reason. You can look into that. <laughs> but <laughs> it was such an absurd thing on its face because he he had the safest job of all time on a company that was growing like oh, a gosh. rocket. Like, the, like why would you want to go into venture capital when this was the unicorn? You are literally seated with your ass on the magic unicorn that is going to be a multi-billion dollar company. This is what VC funds and VC people spend years. They spent their whole life looking for one of these motherfuckers. <laughs> this yes. makes no sense at all. <laughs> Especially the timing. Like, the timing he left was when it was about to supernova and everyone thought it could get, like, 100 times bigger or something. I know. It's mental, isn't it? Yeah. There's so. no way. Because, <laughs> by the way, I hope people get the underlying theme of this, which is you're always going to get, I already saw it in the Reddit thread for this woman's post, there'll always be a type of moron who wasn't there and doesn't know the industry, and their take is always like, yeah, but right, it's like, had a massive esports game in league, so it must have succeeded, and it's like, that's not how it works, like, what you have to do is understand what resources did you have to work with, and did you make the best out of that scenario? Like, by your logic, if someone was really rich, and they just made, like, a bunch of ordinary ham and cheese sandwiches, then if they go to, like, a poor village in Africa, they've put on the greatest spread of food ever seen, and it must be greater than, like, a Parisian ball in the 1700s. No, obviously, you idiot. They could have done way better than that, but to poor people, yeah, that's going to be dope, isn't it? So in, in esports terms, because they started with such a crazy budget, as we're saying, when they just injected all the money in the early LCS era, yeah, at that point, Riot was killing the game, and their game got huge in a way that no other game did. The problem was, actually, it's the other way around. They had the golden goose, and they have almost killed it, and they didn't even get all the golden eggs out. They got like one or two and then just guarded it. Whereas well, you could have had hundreds of golden eggs. Because I also think, Monty, the biggest part people do miss about Riot is the other game shit. People are even going to get tricked because of Valorant and TFT and think Riot sort of succeeded there. If you think about how giant those projects were, Monty, six, seven years ago. In fact, they've been working on them the whole time they've had even League of yep. Legends out of people. The card game. They oh. actually, if they'd have really pivoted, right, dude, they would own all of esports right now. They could have had every game. They could have had a shooter, yep. a beat em up. They could have had the whole... It's clearly what they wanted originally. They're just too incompetent to pull it off. I mean, if, if anything, had... it's the opposite. Guys. What they've shown is they could only pull off one massive game so far. We'll see on Valorant. They're close with that one. But no, they they, they actually have been... Uh, they've underwhelmed me. If they really had the vision they acted like, they could have been enormous now. They could, they could be esports. I mean, they literally fumbled making a League of Legends mobile game and let Chinese developers eat their entire fucking lunch. 
on that, which could have it's made them mental. billions that of dollars. One didn't get nailed because you know this as well, Monty. That's how you know these aren't esports people. If you went to Korea at the time you were living there, every person on the underground is playing Battle Royale slash Dungeon Crawl slash these types of games. Like for real, if you'd have had literally League of Legends branded mobile thing, everyone on that train would have been playing yep. it. You know what I mean? It would have been, it would have been maybe even bigger than the fucking PC version. I've even seen a world where if that had gotten huge and you make the controls easy, oh, yeah. like they did with the Arena of Valor or whatever, it yep. would, like, little kids would play it, people who don't even yep. have PCs, you could actually have been the biggest game in the world with that. Yeah, I agree. They, 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 were, they, they were a day so late and a badly. dollar short with Wild Rift, yes. and it was only after yep. uh, they realized the incredible fumble that they had made um, that yep. they create, started creating Wild Rift, but it was too late. Like, they missed their, their opportunity in the market. Um, and, I mean, that is... That is shocking because they could have had a game even be bigger than League of Legends based off of phone microtransactions making billions and billions of dollars like Candy Crush did for Activision Blizzard. You know what I mean? And by the way, even though people are going to point to Valorant as a success because Valorant has done things like help realign like the relationship between team orgs and a game developer, etc. It has done some things well, but here's the problem. Anyone who knows Counter-Strike knows Valorant has one of the worst designed esports circuits ever to the yep. extent that top pros, both in interviews and especially privately, have told me en masse, we fucking hate this circuit and we wish we were just back in CS. Like, by the way, even if they're the literal tits at fucking Valorant, they're the absolute best players in the world. I don't think you guys know how crazy this is. That would be like someone who used to be good in Dota five years ago being trophy today and telling me, I hate League of Legends in the circuit. I wish I could go back <laughs> to Dota, even if I wouldn't be me in that game. Like, that's a pretty big indictment. Normally, a player is incentivized to, like, mindfuck himself that it's all cool and it's all fine. So, basically, I would say Valorant actually is the proof of what I'm talking about. It's proof that even when they have a game with, like, it's blowing up as a game, there's interest. By the way, people do like certain things about the circuit, but they've done certain things fundamentally wrong that, sure, they don't understand what esports is. Because if you don't know, by the way, you know how everyone complained? I'll give the League of Legends example. You know when people like Rogue got eliminated this split? It meant that when they got eliminated, they had something insane like six months off for the rest of this year, even though they have a, a salary and they're supposed to be playing. That that can happen to you in Valorant, guys, if you're just not something mad like top three in top your three. region. <laughs> yeah. so, so you can be, and this happened, you can be the reigning world champion and your whole year can be done like with five to six months to go. Like that's yep. how badly that circuit's designed. Because the reason that's mental is that also shows they don't get the game because Counter-Strike, the game they're obviously contrasted against, obviously has the opposite problem like next year we're going back to the old bad old days Monty where there's going to be event on event yep. on event on event event and there'll never there'll never be a week without an event so why do you why would you do the opposite extreme and do one where you have like two events a year so to, it just shows that when they actually have a chance because this is the time they didn't have this the giant game in the same way they have with league they just don't get esports mate they have a very or they think they're going to reinvent it I've always I've always thought it's a bit of both I think they also feel like they have to reinvent it in their image if you know what I mean they can't do something tried and tested because isn't that half the problem with the OGN thing if you were if you weren't an idiot you'd just delegate to the OGM people and go you guys have been killing it just take my yes. product and do, do it you do it your way well, in the Korean style on this Korean thing and I'll do my American shit over here instead they tried to interfere and fucking put their finger on the scale didn't they it also just makes more no sense because your core competency as a developer is not operating like sports entertainment products and broadcast oh, so then you yeah. have to hire all those people and and by the way guys you can tell that Riot doesn't actually want to hire these people anymore. You know they know they fucked up because what they've been doing, guys, is that they moved a lot of the production out of Berlin to a third-party company operating out of Dublin in their studio in Dublin. They built a facility in Dublin and have staffed it with not Riot employees through a contracted company, and they fired everybody at LEC. So Riot themselves is now tired of having full-time esports well, employees. Way, remember as well, that also, by the way, to me, actually hints that they didn't have an unlimited force anymore, Monty. Because you know the real yeah. reason why so many companies famously went to Ireland is because Ireland did that thing as part of the EU where like you don't have the same like corporate tax or whatever. Yes. So all those companies, I know like it's right, like John Romero on his like small indie dev company there. Loads of people, that's actually quite a cynical move. I'm also amazed they did it because even though so far they haven't had problems, Monty, the reason my mind was blown when I found out about that striker facility is look, in the modern day, I have no idea what the network is like now. But back in the day, Monty, Ireland was notorious for having really bad internet connections compared to like mainland UK. So I was also amazed at the idea you'd build like a global like broadcasting hub and then put it somewhere that might have dodgy, but apparently it hasn't. I've never seen any problems to be fair. Maybe it does work.
Maybe it does. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it has been working. They've been doing like a lot of, I think, the LPL broadcasts out of there. Like they run a lot of the control room for the LEC broadcasts out of there. So uh, part of it is like Riot's bought up so much dark fiber like around the world. Do a, do a documentary on that place. That would be cool. I'd like to see that. You know how you move between yeah. the places. This one's doing this game over here. That would be interesting. I'd actually like to just see logistically outruns. Yeah. But my point is, is like they're tired of having you know, all of these full-time employees because they're a burden to the company and they can't just get rid of them at will, especially in places like Europe. So they're trying to change that um, in order to reduce their long-term costs when it comes to um, operating esports. And that's very convenient, Thorne, because now the Saudis have come along and those those people who are in Dublin get to be swapped out. <laughs> At the drop of a hat, right? <laughs> Potentially, if like, you know, ESL wants to do that, well, all of a sudden, you know, oh, we'll just pipe it over to uh, Cologne instead or Katowice or another ESL hub where also they can operate this thing. remember that thing. thing. Remember what we also said before, Monty, is technically the one thing that's actually really unfortunate if you don't like the Saudi influence is they have low key already got the sweet spot time zone. So even would be yep. the best place to have a hub like that, Monty, because yes. if you wanted to do the whole world's broadcasting, you should probably do it from the side, Middle East, believe it or not. If you just look on the time zones, it's bizarrely just the sweet spot between Asia and the West, isn't it? It's like yep. we've got some sort of fucked up esports Silk Road, basically. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that that is uh that is some of the stuff that's been going on with riot guys uh that is it is depressing as usual well i don't think nas leaving is particular i'm not depressed by that right that's it's not more... a big deal is it? I don't, that's whatever that's <laughs> I what don't i think it's just the on the titanic in it <laughs> the one i will say though Bunty, the take that is the worst take of all is holy i know reddit is astro turf but are there that many NPCs slash operatives? Are there really no humans left in there? Like, is the joke that at this point, the subreddit for League of Legends, Monty, is like those stories you'll have heard about that occasionally come out in, like, media, where it'll be like, you know, there's a drug meet, and there's, like, four sets of criminals, and it turns out it was all different branches of, like, the American, you know, one's, like, the DEA, one's an FBI agent, one's, like, you know, fucking, you know those stories where, like, in the end, there's no actual criminal in the room, and they're just like, wait, we're all setting each other up and then trapping each other. That, that must be what Reddit's like now, because, bro, I can't <laughs> believe these takes for real that just take any job at Riot and go, should just give that to Mark Z? Why? Why would you do that? Well, because you used to like his comments on Hotline League and you've liked the way he has tweeted videos saying what he is being told to say and do at Riot. That means now he should have the biggest executive jobs in the industry and potentially blow hundreds of millions of dollars slash billions in stock value. We're just going to put all that in Mark Z's hands because you're like... I like him. It's like, you guys are so... By the way, I'm, we've spent this episode roasting Riot, but you if you are like that, you are the most feckless idiots in the world. And in some ways, don't you deserve this esports industry? This is The problem I have is I deserve a better esports industry, Monty. They don't. They deserve Mark Z running everything. You know what I mean? Like, fucking hell. Like, this is idiocracy. You, you would vote Mark Z the president. I mean, he'd be like Terry Crews' character in idiocracy. Like, hey, like, he'd just be him, wouldn't he? Like, yeah, that's who you would vote as your president, guys. My, my question is, will Mark Z change the world's formats? Because if so, I'm in. <laughs> okay, listen, I can't lie. After seeing all that, Monty, if he just sent me a DM now, like, but if I was in, first thing I would do is double a limb for Worlds. I'd be like, that oh, Marksy, I think he's got potential. You know what? He's been hard to invite. You know what? Maybe we need fresh voices, Monty. We don't need this entire old. I, yeah, I can't lie. I, I just need that double limb bracket. Because I was even thinking about this actually last night. Bizarrely, coincidence, Monty. I was just thinking last night, bro, the reason it's so brutal that we have the double limb bracket on MSI now is it's no longer just hypothetical. It really makes you realize we could have this. And I was just thinking of Last Worlds, bro. Think about Last Worlds. Let me just do a little rundown for you for a second, guys. Last Worlds, you would have had a lower bracket that would have been inc the best of all time. It would have had Gen G in it, JDG, KT Rolster, LNG. Holy fuck. By the way, it would even have had NRG if you want the NA one. They'd at least have one more match, wouldn't they? I don't think they'd win it, but they'd... Bro, that lower bracket would have been incredible. I mean, also, you could have had Weibo, Weibo wouldn't have made the finals. The Weibo wouldn't have made the finals. Was, and by the way, the other reason also to me why it's so dumb that we don't have it is, if T1 had have won, that would have been the greatest story in the history of esports. I don't, if they could have won with that double limb bracket and those teams, that would have been really insane. It was already very impressive anyway in single limb, but no, that's a, like a perfect example. Of where I do wish they would change that. Like, I, I need that lower bracket, bro. I need it. I need it. <laughs>
Because the same thing's going to happen this way. Are you ready? I'll do my prediction. Same thing's going to happen this world. So remember, you can only have eight teams in this bracket in single limb, Monty. Well, we've already got too many teams. Like, we've already got Hanwa and Genji and T1. By the way, we even got like D plus might sneak in there last second. In China, it's fucking insanely stacked right now. You could go like four or five teams deep, man. Like, it's really hard to even know who the third and fourth best teams are there. Like, actually, teams like NIP aren't even relevant now if people don't know. They're just complete shit. And be, FPX is irrelevant. Like, none of these teams are even top teams anymore. So... Their bracket is going to basically, if you get a bad draw, it's going to ruin the whole tournament, I'm telling you right now. If we had the lower bracket, it would fix so many things. We'd get all the matchups we want almost, you know? Yeah, and by the way, you know, all of these people who have been in charge of LOL Esports are exactly the ones who, like, just wouldn't change world's formats for a decade. It took them eight years to change the MSI format to this. By the way, why are we not doing that? Why are we, why why does Riot themselves? This is another weird thing if we want to talk about a bigger picture on Riot the company, Monty. They do this weird thing where even if it is a different person making the decision, they can never imply they made the decision because the old decision wasn't the right one. They can <laughs> never crazy, be wrong it? somehow. It, <laughs> instead of ever being wrong, they just always made good decisions. They're making even better ones now. Like, it's some fucked up thing. Or, where like, It's or, like participation or, of one culture. Or they, I don't well, get they, it. the way they frame it is that the mistaken decision was actually unavoidable, and now they are correcting it. But there wasn't a way to just make the right decision in the first place. Because to me, after this one especially, where you've seen it run twice now with MSI, surely after seeing Double Limb for MSI twice, it would even be the easiest slam dunk of all time to be like, we're just going to do it for Worlds. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that just be like rapturous applause from everyone? Like, what would the downside be? I don't get it. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I have no idea, man. Because, I look, I, I'm becoming more convinced that the partnerships that they sold are like re required to like move the tournament around. That's what I think is actually happening here. Like, I right. think they oh, wait, sold... Wait, just, just for reference, for anyone who doesn't know, the reason also it's mental that they don't do this is champions in Valorant is their equivalent of Worlds, and it is double limb. And it's all in one location. And that's been the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so they obviously, even though they said in that John Needham statement, they don't think it's like appropriate for Worlds. They're just full of shit. Like they just made that up arbitrarily for some reason. I don't know why. He never really gave a reason, did he? I, you know, I don't know if they like sold MasterCard and it has to have like live activations in X number of cities. Like that's the only thing I can come up with right. as to why this exists the way it does right now. There must They must be locked in in some way because on its face, it makes no sense. It also just costs them more money, which you would think they would want to save at this point in time. I mean, the obvious joke is you can just do a whole thing, can't you, Monty? Cost of rearranging the marketing budget could be millions of dollars, you know. <laughs> Cost in the industry of, you know, losing a great deal that was, you know, one of the leaders for your agency. But the feeling of having double a limb and a great tournament, of priceless. There's some well, things I... money can buy. For other things, MasterCard can fuck off and I want a low bracket. So basically, I've done an anti-MasterCard skit there. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> I, but it's like also, you know, what the, the question becomes, what happens if they move worlds to a single like country or single city and make it double a limb and it's wildly successful and everybody loves it? It reflects really badly on the people who made those other decisions because then you have to say, well, why weren't we doing this years ago? Right. I still don't um, understand why we do move around the countries. Like again, I assume it's like you said it's just some cynical market and shit, but to me, I think it makes more sense. Like like the CS Med just be in one place. Pick one place, like cool and go there. Yeah. Uh, that's that's literally what they do with Valorant, by the way. Champions is in Seoul. Oh, I've like, just realized oh, in a couple I've just of weeks. Realized Monty. <laughs> You know, the other thing they can also do is they can also do the boiling the frog slowly approach to bringing the Saudis in. You don't just go straight to Worlds is in Riyadh. What you do, Monty, is because Riyadh is part of the AMEA region, you just have it in Europe. Then you have like, you know, the group stages in like the studio. Then you have like quarterfinals is in Paris and Germany. You see where I'm going here. Then you have semis, one's in Spain, one's in Sweden. And magically the finals in Riyadh. It's like you just you back door into it, mate. I think they're going to do with that. I think that's what they're going to do do eventually clearly <laughs> it's okay chris greeley has assured us in very plain speech and not at all being questionable or subversive in his phraseology that uh you know it won't it it definitely won't be in riyadh <laughs> this motherfucker <laughs> well guys if you would like after that segment, to wash the stench of riots as we go into some actual League of Legends. Although, I will say probably what we're going to talk about next is the LEC finals, which were quite uh, putrid in their own right. So this may not save you. But we can talk about our new sponsor, Mando.
here on Summoning Insight. And what this is, is soaps and deodorants for men, as, as you might have surmised from the name Mando. Uh, so they offer soaps in a variety of forms. Bar soap. Uh, there you go. There's, a, there's the deodorant wipes uh, if you're camping. Wipes, I think. Yeah, wipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wipes. Cool. If you're camping, if you're on the go, uh, you need to freshen up a little bit. Those are a good option. You can chuck them in your backpack or whatever and always have that. Um, I know, especially for me, uh, I'm in Korea right now, and it is monsoon season, which means that it is 85% humidity and hot as hell and like hot rain so it is miserable and uh this has been helping me get through you know showering with this deodorant with this does help me a lot they have different kinds of deodorant they have like a cream deodorant that's like a lotion they have a stick deodorant they have lots of different scents um like bourbon leather very masculine or clover woods mount fuji these are some of the options that they have it's it is not an antiperspirant uh which i like because it's aluminum free um so i've been really enjoying it my wife endorses it as well i can tell you that so um and you can experiment with a variety of different products and scents by getting um uh by picking up the uh the starter pack right uh and yes. that's what our sponsorship is for so you can control body odor anywhere at shopmando.com and get $5 off your starter pack. That's over 40% off with the promo code summoning at shopmando.com. Um, and this is great, guys. Would would seriously recommend it. The Mando starter pack is perfect for new customers. Comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice, body wash, deodorant, right wipes, and free shipping. So that's $5 off. Use code Summoning at shopmando.com, S H O P M A N D O.com. You've been enjoying it, Thorin? <laughs> yeah, I mainly use, I have like a bar of soap I use in the shower, and then I have the. Uh, the wipes, as you can see there. If people don't know, like the interesting thing is like that thing you say, which is how it works to like stop body odor, which by the way, is spoiler. We're not even saying it to roast you guys. Like you think I'm going to do a whole thing like, because you're getting not all of us. Like, first of all, it's summer yes. anyway. So if you sat your PC <laughs> indoors, you're going to be sweating. And then secondly, I would say because we're gamers and we're sat in a room on our own, it's actually quite natural that we don't always know that we're like smell a little bit ripe as we say in yep. England. So the reason this shit's actually really interesting is because I was actually reading up when they put it in the promotional materials what the mechanism is. And as you say, it's not an antiperspirant. Like what this does is antiperspirants actually literally block the skin the so that the sweat can't come out, which is why unfortunately they have chemicals in like you're saying, which we want to avoid by instead using Mando, right? And Mando's instead, what it does is it actually attacks the bacteria that eats the sweat, which makes the odor. Because so, I didn't actually know that was how that works. That's, that's the mechanism how it works. So it's actually like basically a way better approach. So it does, <laughs> you, you won't have the smell. It reduces that, but it's not doing it in some way that's going to fuck with your like internal system basically which is the problem with any person as far as i know yeah and uh, and by the way guys i have used other non-antiperspirant non-aluminum based deodorants this one works the best for me at least that i've tried it's been the most effective so i also go. do think as well put it this way this isn't like something where it's like fucking your girlfriend's got like all crazy smell the smells are also like i think like nice but quite yes. neutral too like they're like very inoffensive i like the bar you can even get unscented it if you some want big smell yeah <laughs> I, 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 I enjoyed it like <laughs> so, i can see what, if you're a man they've sort of nailed the vibe for me i think the yeah. atmosphere the aesthetics what i want it to be yes yeah, so good stuff. Thank you to Mando again, supporting So sponsors. anyone who takes advantage of the starter pack and gets yeah. the $5 and you can, off you, Yeah, yeah, five bucks off, free shipping. And you can try it. You get the menu, you can try out a few cents. It's like a, an easy way just to, to give a, the product a try. So if you have been looking for way, another alternative, you've heard, go for it. Even though a million shows tell you, and if you do this, it helps. And half of them are just saying that for the sake of saying, we actually mean it. Like if it didn't, by the way, <laughs> we wouldn't say it. it. So <laughs> literally our company, one of the main ways it actually survives so far is off people liking the products that we get because yes. we vet them as legit products, things that we would use. I, if I even retweet this the other day. I personally wouldn't promote anything I wouldn't buy myself or ever use. So I think so far we've done a pretty good job with it. And actually you guys have been killing it. Like we've got an amazing response so far. Yep. So thank you guys. And, and so I would have... able to bring in Yamato Cannon and do the sack down and all that stuff. 
Yep. Finally, if you know what, Monty, people don't realise we should have done this joke at the beginning. We've given you what you've been asking for the whole time, the crackdown without foreign. <laughs> what more can you want? It's fine. You've been happened. asking for it for five years or whatever, Reddit's three thrilled. years, whatever it is. Yeah, whatever. Well, except, you should be except, loving it. Except now Reddit hates Dom, so. <laughs> oh, but there you go. You can't have a win, can you? Exactly. It's like the moment I left, Dom just became but, the new Thorin but, and now they're done with him but, too. But right? you see, Thorin, what if we could have a crackdown without Dom or Thorin? That's, that's the next question. We'll call Indeed. it Hotline League. Uh... <laughs> and also the reason that show as a little bit of behind the scenes works, if people don't know, is because I actually think Dom is now at the point where he can do that show on his own. If people don't know, when he first started that show with me, he'd never done like long form podcasts. And so he didn't understand hosting. If you ever watch the original crackdown, I'm actually half the time almost giving Dom an example of how to interview people and how to keep the conversation going and keep it interesting and then pass it between people. You, you can see him level up as the years go on. But also oh, yeah. the other thing a lot of people don't know about the crackdown is, you know, the crackdown had the basically the best guest list of all time once you like at their prime. We used to just oh, get yeah. any G2 member we wanted. Spoiler. I was the one booking that show. <laughs> That's one of my skills in esports. So I also think the difference is back then, Dom was famous, but he didn't have everyone added. He didn't have everyone. He hadn't appeared on shows with everyone. Once you've done it, once you've got the network that I have, it's like having the, the Rolodex, Rolodex in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like being the Mad Men guy who has the phone number of everyone. Well, now Dom has it. So now we can yep. get anyone he wants. So he, yep. at this point, he doesn't actually need me. It's all good. And I thought it was great. I watched the first episode. Yep. I enjoyed it. Uh, and also I enjoyed uh, Dom's rant on the state of LEC. Oh, because... Better, Holy shit, that was guys. Actually, that was actually just a... That, that moment was like Dom's, like, you know, the classic film Network, Monty, from like 1976 yes. or whatever it is, where the guy just like, I'm sick, of, I'm sick as hell, I'm not going to take it. That was like I'm his version, but it was really good. It, it was anymore. really good, though, wasn't it? Like, it was so earnest. And, and by the way, on point as well, he was absolutely spitting, as the kids say there. He was fucking killing it. <laughs> well, it's actually I, a really good speech. And, and I'm sure you guys have been waiting for this, because, like, obviously it was a dumpster fire. And part of this... Look, I hear you guys. There's, there's a lot of negative sentiment around the LEC for format and i want to say i still like the lec format what i don't I like about the lec format is that we have summer playoffs into season finals which makes summer playoffs yep. feel really shit as for having the three splits i don't think the three splits is a problem remember no know. one complained about three tournaments of ogn back in the day it was just fucking awesome yep. like the number of, of splits is not the issue the problem is is that the product of lec has been degraded to the point that it is no longer hype and it seems like and it feels like the teams don't even care thorin because you get these kind of like slumps in performance from teams that are basically like already qualified to the season finals and that's what they care about most i mean by winning like g2 technically did qualify for worlds but it's the last seed in europe so you know they're just going to keep trying anyway it just feels like LEC should have had no summer uh, summer playoffs. The summer regular season then seeds into this, the season finals, and then we just have that, which is going to end in a stadium in Germany, in Munich. And that would actually feel good. But instead, we get this like kind of abomination where we get an absolutely what feels like pointless and hypeless playoffs in the studios in Berlin. Well, they did actually play as if it was pointless and hypeless and had no meaning <laughs> That's what I'm was going through the motion. But, but, but yeah. I mean, like, as, as a professional player, you can't just delude yourself into thinking, oh, this is the most important match of my career, so I'm definitely going to play Post. like it, right? The psychology definitely of what you're expecting and what the stakes are does actually, play, you know, go into your oh, performance. For sure. But the, and, I think you even find that the most with veterans. Like, if you notice, the mega OG veterans, they can't get up for every random round one playoff match in spring, if you know what I mean, Monty. But if you put them into a gauntlet or something to go to Worlds, they'll be fucking dialed in. Or you can see it. I, I agree. So I like it just felt like none of the teams in playoffs were really like turned on and wanted to be here, except for maybe Carmine Corp, but that's because they were actually fighting for something, right? They were actually fighting to potentially get into season finals. And frankly, it's a bummer that they didn't because they're a better team right oh, now than a couple of the teams that are actually oh, in the season. Yeah, we're about the Mad Lions, all of those teams. <laughs> Giant <course>. X. <laughs> like, you know. So yeah. it is it is rather a depressing state of affairs. And then I think the like the shit cherry on top of the shit Sunday was this really so i mean there are a couple things first off swapping the schedule because of valorant so that they played a winner's bracket final on a what a tuesday felt fucking horrible um and then you so they swap the schedule so you don't even know 
when to watch things, and then they immediately start up again on Friday. And so it felt like really anticlimactic because they were fucking with the actual schedule of the league and your watch times as they were going into some very important playoff matches. And then the playoff matches itself were boring and horrible. And the quality of the matches was just fucking dumpster tier. But it is, it was legitimately embarrassing, like both for G2 and Fnatic, obviously, especially for for Fnatic, but let's not pretend that G2 was fucking amazing. I mean, they didn't deserve to win any games in this series. Like it was a 3-0, but it should have been a 3-0 for Fnatic, which is hilarious. But this was probably one of the most disappointing and like depressing fucking tier one region finals I have ever seen. It was my joke. This was the LEC playoffs directed by Ryan Johnson. So here's why. (laughs) Because everything was about subverting your expectations. But as Richard has pointed out, you could subvert someone's expectations and make it really good. The way they subvert it is, you think this is going to be awesome. It's going to be shit. So what he did is he ruined every part. Think about the storylines I'm going to now destroy by what happened in those games. So as you said, Monty, there was actually going into the, the battle for the top four, there was only one team had a reason to be insanely motivated, and it was Carmine Cop. Because if they won that match against BDS, they made it to the season finals. And they got all the way to game five. And by the way, if you saw how they were playing, they were actually playing way better than you'd expect. Like they had leveled up for the... It's literally everything we've always wanted with formats like gauntlets and things where you take the team that's hot in summer. This is this would be exactly the team you would want in those season finals to maybe battle for that last... Like an outside chance at the last spot for Worlds. Instead, they got to game five, right where you you're excited and then they lost so it didn't matter and they now will not be in those finals but you still have to watch Mad Lions play then after that it's like okay well fair enough we've got BDS Monty as long as BDS plays great oh, maybe God. BDS can actually be in the final you know what we can have a final without G2 well you know what if you want to see throws people forget you have to wait before the Fnatic one go to the BDS one dude BDS did this last year to Fnatic where they almost beat them and then got back. They could absolutely have won this series all day long over G2. G2 has never looked more like they want to go home. So BDS blew that one. Meaning, by the way, by the time G2 makes the finals, we have no solid teams in the finals. Everyone's had whack player. (laughs) And then the final itself was actually an abomination. Like, what's so mad about it is there's some side topics we can get into later on how like some of the Fnatic players have reacted. They're completely delusional, mate. But like, I don't know that I've ever seen a more embarrassing domestic final though. Because here's the problem. If this was that Fnatic played insane and got leads, but then G2 played like the greatest league ever and clawed back into the game, we would actually be saying this is the best finals ever. It wasn't. What happened is Fnatic got leads, (laughs) utterly pissed them away in like an almost match-fixing level of incompetence. And then G2 themselves tripped over their own feet and like accidentally shot the wrong person, but that turned out to be a Fnatic. You know what I mean? It was like, it was literally a cavalcade of errors this final. It was actually one of the most low-quality files I've ever seen, bro. It was really If there was an announcement tomorrow that said that all of Fnatic's players were suspended indefinitely for match fixing. BCS style. (laughs) BCS style. I would fucking believe you because it's almost impossible that you could play this badly if you had made it to a tier one region final in League of Legends. Like this was so embarrassing from all, everybody involved, you know, I just want these players to think about the privilege in their lives. Literally thousands of generations it's taken to produce these young men. They have the absolute luxury of unlike literally every single ancestor they've ever had trying to claw a living out of the earth up against the elements. It, they're grandfathers or great grandfathers were fighting for their homes in world war ii these guys have the absolute privilege to play a fucking video game for a, li- for a living and they can't even fucking put in a tiny bit a one atom of extra effort to not play like complete dog shit like if you By actually way, think just, about just, it just it as an outrageous outside. I'm actually low key as a result of Monty's setup there. Just really glad that Carmine Cobb didn't make the final. Just think about what he said about fight their grandfather's fight you will not anyway. That's okay. I, I kept it subtle, but just you know, on the wrong side would be the joke, couldn't they be on the wrong side, Monty? No, but like but, that is the wildest thing. Because you know, there's a concept I've got for you, you're all gonna love, right? Lopez, Tommy Coven, who works with us at Last Federation and obviously worked as a foot professional player in CS 1.6 and worked with Immortals and MIBR as a financial guy, right? 
he had a great line in Counter Strike back in the day, a concept that you're going to love, Monty. He invented a concept called you win the round if you take your hands off the keyboard. So there's times in Counter Strike, like for example, when basically the other guy isn't coming to defuse the bomb, but if you peek him and he can kill you, then actually he would defuse the bomb because he's sure, got a yeah, chance. Yeah. The scenarios where if you knew it and you actually knew all the info, you would just sit in a corner and not even touch anything and you would win because the other guy would never do the right thing to win the round. But you can fuck it up by pressing the wrong keys and moving and going out and, and you throw the round. This game, look, it's not quite as similar because you couldn't take your hands off the keyboard. But essentially, Monty, I don't know if I've ever seen more games where the team with the massive lead just doesn't have to do anything. There's no The team behind has no agency. In fact, there's moments in this final where the only way Fnatic can lose is if they just go and G2's all grouped up and they just have a fight with them normally yep. as if it was an even state. And they do it over... Like, essentially, these guys can't turn down an invitation, bro. Like... Anytime G2 is like, would you like to dance? They have to. They just have to. Even though <laughs> some of these games, like every mechanic Riot put in the game, they had every advantage you could ever have. Like, like, like some of these losses. That's why I say, Monty, unfortunately, you can't credit G2. Like, you know, last year no. where we kept glazing GDG for coming back in those days, that was actually amazing shit, mate. Yes. This was for real some like noob solo queue thing of G2. Like, let's just do like a group all five. And if we get really lucky, we'll fight. And they were just, it was working. Like, that was so, that was like some whack flag. V fucking no, mighty dog was, shit. Man. It was, it it was, was actually, garbage. It was actually it was garbage. wild. They were like, but what if we could just mind control them into fighting yeah. us in the world's stupidest ways over and over and over again? And then just Fnatic did it. Um, instead of, I don't know, side laning, doing an objective. I think the the the, the funniest example of this, Thorin, when I was, uh, I mean, these whole games are obviously shit shows. I mean, we could start with G2. How the fuck do you get in these situations? Like Mickey X is like fucking running it down in games two and three, for as far as I can tell, no fucking reason on the Nautilus and Lane. These are situations. Look, Mickey was terrific last year. He absolutely deserved the Maybe year. Even in the winter, he was really good. At the beginning yeah. of the year, he was I mean, good too. He just fell off after that. He's been falling off in the last, like, couple of splits. But, I mean, Mickey was yep. extraordinary and absolutely 100% deserved LEC MVP because he was so good and so consistent all of last year. But this is a shameful performance from him. Like, he shouldn't be putting his team in these kind of situations no, no. Uh, in the early game and it's not because of him they, they that they came back really either kind of was i guess in the poppy game like he actually did have some really good ults in that game so credit to him like it did it did uh pick up i think as the game went on but i mean if you look at game two fanatic what the fuck are you doing man so if you guys haven't seen it, you can go back and you can watch the best of three where BNK Fear X actually beats T1 from a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that happens in that game is right after 20 minutes, Faker TP's bot on Tristana and BNK Fear X is running a Zyra and they just run to Baron. And because Zyra can basically can almost solo Baron at 20 minutes by putting down a bunch of plants and using her ult, you see them take the Baron. Fnatic in this game has Zyra and one of the fucking fettest Ezreals in the early game I've ever seen. Now, oh, let me explain, guys. Yeah. Ezreal is fucking broken right now. So to get this fed on him is outrageous. If you are at 22 minutes into this game, Fnatic can absolutely two-man this Baron with Ezreal and Zyra. Do they push out side lanes and create pressure and, like, threaten this Baron? No. They literally just fart around doing nothing until they charge up mid lane and lose the game. It is pathetic that they are trying to do some of these things they have no objective control they're ignoring baron soul or uh, dragon soul opportunities like it looked like they had no idea how to take an objective in these games even when they were just handed them on a silver platter and this isn't theoretical stuff this is stuff we have seen teams doing in this meta that they should be as professional players aware of i am pretty sure that they watched that series that t1 lost to fear to fear x I'm pretty sure they watched that because it was a notable upset. They're probably like, how did T1 lose? This Irish shit's ridiculous. Teams all over the world are doing 20-minute Barons. You cannot leave Baron alone with the Zyra on the enemy team. If you have Zyra, you should be constantly pressing, uh, pressuring that Baron. It's outrageous. Like, even the individual misplays. 
even the individual misplays in this series are crazy, right? They're like, I mean, this is what I think's mental, mate. Is let me just give you a contrast that shows you how utterly fucked in the head fa fans are, right? Monty, this might blow your mind. You might have seen me whine about it on Twitter, so you're probably aware of this now. But believe it or not, after, like you know, Kami Corp's entire globe, this split is one because they changed the roster fundamentally, yes, and the top side of the map knows exactly players. what they're doing. But the other thing is, the main carry of the team actually is upset, unironically. Understandably, yeah, he can be on the Zeri and the Kaiser and all these champions where he can like, reposition himself and he doesn't have to trust other people and doesn't have to worry about Targarmus in lane, etc. Right? He has basically been smurfing. And for real, he's actually one of the best ADCs again, mate. Like, if you give him a couple of kills and a champion, he carries the game. Bro... Everyone who watched that series against fucking uh, BDS was flaming upset and going, see, he couldn't even carry. Bro, if he had the leads, Noah would. He'd be an LEC champion right now. Yeah. Like, Noah <laughs> had the most egregious leads on the most broken ADC champions, and he was just fucking doing nothing. He was just throwing these games. Like, I, it's actually insane. I've never seen someone just get caught, popped, killed, do no damage, do no auto attack, just step backwards. With, oh, what was that? Bro, like, the reason it's so egregious is I've talked about this on past so many inset episodes. He was the one who earlier this year around spring had the gall to call fans out and say fans were stupid and called him a one trick and said he was the reason Fnatic was failing and that he would prove them wrong and win and show that well you know what you didn't they literally it's like that meme that goes you know my hate the haters said I couldn't do it actually they were right honestly good call by the haters it's like there's like a meme <laughs> like that because he should do that he should fucking apologize like that means all your haters were right spoiler you were the reason Fnatic did not win this LEC title this was the time when G2 absolutely were handing you the crown this yep. was this was the worst G2 win ever in the history of the org they were handing you the crown and you couldn't even pick it up you stumbled over your own feet and threw it back onto Mickey X's <laughs> what, head what? as he was attempting to end. <laughs> like what's crazy about this too was that it was a 3-0 Thorin. Like it's not oh, it's even ridiculous, like, it? oh it was a five game clown fiesta. It was literally three throws consecutively because you have a feeling if Fnatic could have won one of these games they probably could have just won the whole series eventually if they had just stopped throwing at any point in time because they looked pretty convincingly better for a lot of the stages of the game. Weren't the but stats something like that the leads were like eight to nine K fucking oh, yeah. lead. Like, by the way, if people don't know in the modern day, that's like an insurmountable gold lead. Well, you don't it, win against that. It's, it's even funnier. It's not that it was just like an eight or nine K gold lead. It was an eight or nine K gold lead. And then G2 won in sub 30 minutes. This isn't like G2 dragged it out until 50 minutes. Oh, exactly. How the fuck does that scale. happen? Yep. <laughs> and, and the answer is like, Noah was playing much too aggressively on the Ezreal. He was eating forward. He was getting split off from his team. He was getting picked off and he was losing the game. And we saw this too. We've seen this with other Ezreal players. Aiming was flamed massively for his performance Boss. against Gen G when he was on Ezreal and he basically solo lost the game for D plus when they were on the cusp of ending, you know, Gen G's domestic win streak in the LCK in that game number three. He fucked it up and it ended the game, but that was a much closer game. This was a game with an eight or 9,000, maybe even 10,000 gold difference that absolutely could, you know, they couldn't close and they were fucking up team fights. They were opting into fights that made no sense, right? They were in engagements where they didn't have all their players there or they were they were so scared. I mean, game two, the funny thing is they had a million chances to do the Baron with Azira, like I said. And then when yep. it comes actual time to do the Baron, Razork wastes his smite on Caps' Corky. He literally smites a Corky that is valking into his team that dies instantly doesn't have to use smite, then doesn't have smite for the Baron fight, and they're concerned about, like, a steal from a flashless brand and a Jin ult fourth shot. And it's like, why are we even in this position? Like, you guys not know how to take this Baron? Like, uh, why is every, why do you have, you know, why do you not just finish the Baron? Why are some of the people not actually zoning the right people or marking the right people on the outside of the pit? It's crazy. It was, I, it, I think everybody who watched this finals felt like they were watching a ninth versus 10th team in the LEC. This is horrible. Like this, this cannot be the quality of teams. And what's even more surprising Thorne is G2 was one of the top four teams in the world at MSI. And they looked extremely good. Like, how do you, how does this happen to this team? It's wild. By the way, this is also why, though, you want more tournaments like EWC and now, it, like, imagine if everyone got to ride that narrative from MSI to Worlds and we just the whole time we're like, maybe they can beat all the top. Like, this team wouldn't, they barely beat Fnatic. Oh, it was so whack, bro. It was so fucking whack, that final.
Yeah, and look, I don't know what is wrong with Europe as a region. I don't know if everybody is just so convinced that they're going to lose to G2 that they just, you oh, know, they have this aura. Up, they yeah, all... they just have this aura about them, like when teams play Faker in T1, where they just randomly int for in very uncharacteristic ways. But it feels like, you know, it feels like G2 just has this, like, God-tier blessing upon them where they just cannot lose no matter what the enemy, like, the opposing team does. It's like they made a deal with the devil. That's how it feels. I also think the saddest thing that Fnatic couldn't actually get the job done and win is, even though I would hate a world where Noah gets to be the LEC champion, Monty, or people tell me that, like, Oscar and really did just, like, become, like, Wonder or Soaz, which is obviously absurd opinions. <laughs> there is one player I actually did want to win this final, which is fucking Razork, mate. Razork has been so good this year. He almost yep. deserves to win and have everyone say it. He's so insane, mate. He just won by himself as a jungler. Like, he almost did. Like, this guy actually... It's amazing because it's not like Yike ever does anything wrong, but Razork is just... He's just a superstar, mate. He's so fucking good. Like, I mean, he's just one that I've never this... seen someone out. No, but out of jungle, have you ever seen anyone hard carry that? Like in the West, especially. Come on, mate. He fucking carries this team. It's mental. I mean, he, he definitely he's got a good vision for the game, too. He, he was great. He's been great this year. He unfortunately, I think, was not great in this particular matchup. But yeah, of course. at the same time, you do have to look at his Nidalee game in game five in the upper bracket final, which was fantastic in game number five. And I thought, oh man, this guy is like really clutch in this high pressure game. But when it came down to the grand final, nope, just complete dog shit. Like had some good early games, but it's like he needs to be able to lead this team and convert. If he is playing Zyra, he has to call the Baron. You know what I mean? He should know what Zyra is capable of and just fucking go for it. Even if you can start pulling out some TPs or like bait them into the Baron in turn, like you have to do something to accelerate the game. Otherwise, you're just in a situation where you're going to get picked off or you're going to take the wrong Baron eventually and, and get wiped like they did. And then all that gold lead is just going to melt away. It was it was tragic. Like uh, it was I, I really don't I like I really don't know how to explain this one. Like it, the players should be really embarrassed. <laughs> it was such a shit showing. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even know how this could happen, right? I just don't understand how the level of seriousness from the players in the entirety of the LEC could have produced this result in the playoffs. By the way, another thing that is actually crazy is I'm getting so sick. This is an angle no one ever does. So I'm going to do it on this show. I'm getting so sick of being gaslit by professional athletes, Monty. Right? There was a whole thing that happened. I'll give you a quick uh, real-world example. Very recently, obviously, was the European Championships in football in Europe, right? right? Yeah. And when this took place, there was a lot of criticism of the England team particularly, right? Because people thought that they have, like, a superstar roster. But if you ever watched how they play, they didn't play very well. They didn't play together as a team and... Certain people like were essentially like inhibiting each other's styles by having overlap in areas where you wouldn't want overlap, etc., and sort of getting on each other's toes, as it were. And the problem with this is, right, everyone kept criticizing this team and the way it was playing, it was set up and it was managed. But the problem is, Monty, they kept winning most of the games. In fact, they were never losing. So the right. problem is because they kept winning and scoring, and the players were getting a bit pissed off and they were sort of being like, hey, you know, they were doing that us versus the world thing of like everyone's ah, hating classic. on us and overly criticizing, you know, and it's unfair because at the time they were winning the games. And the problem goes like this eventually since you in the end didn't win the championship by the way if you'd won the championship you could have kept that narrative going the whole way because you didn't win in the end in the end people are not only going to be like mad but they're going to be mad that you've just like denied that there was a problem the whole time until you finally lost because of the problem fanatic players are doing the same thing bro i get it right if you do badly in a different split you're like seventh and people overly hate on you that's one thing the people hating on Fnatic now, look, I can't know what message people are sending to Noah, but I mean, the general idea that like Noah isn't playing well enough and he isn't an elite ADC and he is sometimes the reason why they lose because he can't carry a game with a lead. Hasn't that just been objectively proven? Like, that's not even a hater angle, bro. That's just actually like a very reasonable piece of analysis. Now, Lois, I didn't put all the mustard on the hot dog I would put on, which is that he can't do that because he's a bitch and a coward and he's shit and he thinks he's way better than he is and all those messages like, hey, Viper and fucking ruler. I hope to see you at Worlds. Not because of you, dickhead. You'd be the reason why you wouldn't be at Worlds. Like, if anything, <laughs> fucking upset should be playing with them at Worlds, mate. So, no, they, I, I would do it that way. 
of like, no, you are underwhelming and you are costing for that. That's just a fucking legit take. That's not hate. There's nothing mean about that. By the way, here's why it's also not mean, Monty. Do you know the reason why it's not hate, even though people might, again, have gone too far individually with their sentiment about the England players? Bro, you are representing England, like one of the biggest countries in the world in that sport who invented the sport and you have the expectation to be the champion. It's not good enough to like, yeah, but I did well. No, no, bro, you are, you are in the best position. So similarly, if you play for Fnatic, look, I'm not saying Fnatic is G2, but after G2, Fnatic is always going to be one of the one or two names who should have the lineup that can contest G2. That is always going to attract the big name talents, etc. Bro, you're playing for Fnatic. Like, if no one wants no pressure, Monty, and he wants no one to flame him, go play for SK Gaming. If you go play for SK <laughs> Gaming, you won't have this massive fan base hate on you. You won't have a giant subreddit. You know what? When the Royal guy carried, we loved him. When he didn't, we said, oh, well, whatever. First, he plays for SK Gaming. And two, who gives a fuck? SK is not supposed to win the split. If you want to play for Fnatic, it comes with the expectation, right or wrong, that you are going to be a champion and that you will be a very good player. Remember, at the end of the day, people think, ah, here on Reckless. Bro, Prime Reckless was a level Noah's never fucking seen, mate. Like, he has very big... By the way, they even had upset after that. It was world-class. Like, you're not walking into a, a team that had fucking shit at ADCs, mate. You're walking into a region where they expect in Fnatic their ADC to be one of the best players on the team. So fucking live up to it. This is some pussy-ass shit. Like, also, if you're going to get mad at people trash-talking, they don't trash-talk fans, you idiot. The second you did that tweet, you unleashed me, motherfucker. You basically stood in front of a mirror going, Candyman, Candyman, Candyman... <laughs> And I came. I answered the call. I didn't make you do that, did I? I didn't make you do that. But I mean, my references are from 1980s, for fuck's sake. It. I love even it. I, even I was a boy when that movie came out. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it's the really 90s, I think. But anyway, all good. Candyman. Look I it. think they also remade it recently. So maybe some other people Oh, made fair it. enough. Oh, it's um, 1992, apparently. So fair enough. I was I was nine when it came out. So <laughs> Good luck. Good luck getting that reference, kids. <laughs> um, it's a good reference, though. Uh, so uh, w one thing I will say, though, is like if we look at the the org history of Fnatic, uh, I mean, they they literally, Thorin, have never won an LEC title. No, no. The la they, they won the last ever EU LCS title. That's why I always yeah. meme on the Monty that they've never won the LEC because it's, it's technically... But in the Chris Greeley world, it is technically true by the law of the law. See, obviously, spiritually, if I was Chris Greeley, I'd be a, a disingenuous piece of shit because obviously they have won the European Championship. But no, it is true. They've never won LEC. So they have won since 2018, basically. 2018. Amazingly. And, and if you think about all of the second place finishes that they've had in so many playoffs, like... Yep. It, it it almost feels as though, and also the last finals they won and was a lot of great players as well, bro. Think about oh, how yeah. many they've had like an they were like all star teams worth of talent oh, yeah. that come through the door since then. Yeah, well, of course. You know what's funny is like that was the last season that they actually had caps as well, and yep. it feels almost like the uh, you know the the Babe Ruth curse of the the, the Red Sox where so they the got babe, yeah. yeah they got rid of Babe Ruth and they just like, could never win a title ever again. <laughs> this one probably won't last hundred years though, but it is. It is very odd that the number of second place finishes this team could have, but they just, even with entirely different players on their roster virtually, they haven't been able to put together an actual win. And I haven't been second place to G2 that whole time, but like, whatever the fuck is going on, like, it just isn't working. And with remember that. Here's the problem, Monty. The most obvious counter is just to say, well, it's like the Michael Jordan analogy or Tom Brady. You just go, well, how are you supposed to win when there's another generational talent? Because here's the problem, Monty. In the meantime, Mad Lions won three and Rogue won one. So it'd be fine yep. if G2 really won every single split. But because, dude, fucking Rogue. <laughs> like, if you want to talk shit, if you're a Fnatic fan, just think of the word Rogue and you already are justified in being mad that you've never won a split in the LHC. I mean, Mad Lions is crazy too, right? Because it's, it's not like they too. have the pedigree or the money that Fnatic is supposed to have. Yeah, and the best part about the best part about the Mad Lions one is the one last year in Spring Monty. Because if you watch that Kazi interview I did, in winter, they didn't win a single scrim. And then they won the next split over G2. So... <laughs> If you're fanatic, how can you ever win? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we're better than that, surely. So, I, no, I agree. I think it's bad. I think it's bad. I think it's a bad state of affairs for everyone.
Well, and, and also, I, notice how what you've actually done is the opposite of what you wanted. What you actually wanted is so obvious, Monty. This is how the script should have gone. What you wanted was Fnatic to win again. So you're ready, Monty. Now they've beaten G2 twice in two BO5s and they've won a split. But then we have the season finals coming right up. So the chance for the rematch immediately. We have all the hype. You set the city instead G2 won just a whack one. And now they'll probably just win the season finals more yeah. convincingly. And then there never was a hype the whole fucking time. And like I said, there's no company cops. So if you go and look and say, oh, it's also, by the way, you you couldn't have had a worse time. That BDS looked like absolute shit during this entire playoffs too. They looked even way worse. Like all the top teams are in the worst shape ever in Europe. Like I'm actually probably going to write a piece for Substack soon. And it's just going to be like, this is the worst split of LEC ever. Like it's never been at a lower point. If you think of like in history, how good the, the best European team used to for real be a dark horse for Worlds. Like right now, unless G2 can somehow recreate whatever they were doing at MSI, right now G2 would just be like, they would make the playoffs for Worlds and instantly lose to anyone. Anyone. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty convincingly not the best team in the West either with how Team Liquid has been performing recently. So, um, yeah, it's it's a big bummer, I think. I, I mean, I hope they can get it back together. History shows that this iteration of the G2 roster can, in fact, like bounce back from some of the lows that they've had. I mean, we've seen a lot of these players like have low points in their career and then come back and be dominant again. So I'm not that concerned. What I am concerned about is just the other seeds coming out of Europe. Cause are, really are we sending this iteration of BDS, right? Like BDS is fine in best of ones. And the thing about BDS is they have a good coaching staff and they have a good way of playing the game, but that way of playing the game is not translating in higher pressure situations with the veterans and the clutch players come online because they don't really have any star power on this roster. They need some person to carry these games or to step up in those moments. And that person just doesn't exist on this team. Like they're the truth is they're like a bunch of mid players who synergize well, but like Niski, in the playoffs, don't typically perform. The problem their team has is they have just like video, very idiosyncratic set of traditional carries. So Adam is obviously just a weird player who, I always predicted this, and I think it's been borne out now, guys. He would play that way no matter what team he was on. Like, it, when it did work to side lane, magically, that wasn't because of him, guys. That was because of what the rest of the team did in response. You see, now he still does it and just over, extends, dies, doesn't do anything useful, just doesn't fucking get anything off. Then you have Nuke. Like, Nuke's not bad. I would say Nuke's like poor man's Larson, but you see, when it works, it works. He definitely has a champion pool. The problem you really have is the actual best carry on paper should be Ice. He has actually a really good player. Mm -hmm. But you can tell this guy is a guy where I assume he doesn't speak too much, doesn't seem like a leader figure. He's just a guy who just sits and uses his hands. He, he actually seems pretty good. And then the biggest problem you've had in this team easily is if you go back to the beginning of the year, bro, Labrov used to be smurfing on this team. His level has just gone way down. And as he went down, it's only really the Ice guy for me. It's Ice and Nuka, the players that pop off for me. The others like are questionable or fragile or just sometimes fall apart. So it's actually sad in the end because this team, if they'd have had like some real punch, they could have been the champions themselves. Why couldn't they well, have I mean, like, I just think you're never going to win anything with Nuke as a mid laner. Like the solo lanes are just not, <laughs> they're just not the things that are going to put you over the top, right? Sure. Like, sure, Nuke has been suffering in this meta, but he's he doesn't have fucking main character energy. He's not one of, I don't think he's, so, not, no. he's not inheriting the mantle of like great LEC mid laners even, there were even mid laners at lec historically like febovin who had a very you know they they shone very brightly but for a very brief period of time he's never even had that peak like what the fuck oh, is no. this guy's ceiling like his floor and his ceiling feel like they're like an inch apart and that's all you're ever going to get with him I also think, as well, I agree with you. I even get the sense he himself doesn't even believe it. Like, he can say what he likes on Twitter, bro. First of all, I've heard some of that's not even true. Like, he does get hurt by people trash talking and blah, blah, blah. But I also think, put it this way, the thing I despise about Humanoid, I actually wish no card. At least Humanoid thinks he is him, bro. He does think he's expect here. He thinks he's the man, and he can just rock up and do whatever he wants and beat anyone, and he's actually better than this region, and he only should be playing against Faker and Jawu and Scout and fucking Knight. And like, at least he has that fucking swagger, bro. Nuke doesn't have any of that. He has no swagger whatsoever, does he? Like, bro, here's the joke. If Humanoid thinks he's Batman, Nuke thinks he's fucking Alfred. Like, what What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> well, also, Shayo is like, I mean, there, who is the, who is supposed to be the star? 
nature of the team, right? Like we're just back. I mean, we basically are retrying the same experiment that we did with Crown Shot with Ice, which is like oh, every oh, you know what everything it's goes in I'll the Crown Shot bucket. It's rare I'll ever give credit to Twitch chat, but I'll give them this one time. I happen to see it. The guy said that sh that nuke is EU poor belter. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> you know, that's good. That is good. That is good. <laughs> That is good. That is actually very well crafted. Because again, it's like you, you just play not to lose. Like you're just a stable player. You're not bad. The floor's good, but you're also never going to be Bjergsen or Jensen and just like, dominate and carry the league, which in this analogy would be like being caps and humanoids. So, no, I, I think it's actually a pretty on point analogy. And also, you just don't expect much when they go international, do they? Because domestically, these guys are good enough. Paul Butler actually was underrated. But the point is, he wasn't underrated internationally. He was never going to carry the big games against fucking <laughs> Rookie or something. Was he? Come on. Everyone knew that. So, hey, that's actually a buying a reference, fair play. It's a rare uh, and, time. And even though I will say, like, I do think BDS has improved, like, it wasn't, they didn't have a fucking banger showing at Worlds last year. It was basically no, no. just like, you know, them and play ins against bad teams and then a parade of their flaws after that. I mean, they look terrible once they got into the main stage. They look fucking awful um, because they can't hang with the big boys. They can't. In any kind of pressure situation, this is not a team. Like, can you imagine? an upset happening like can in, in I, seriously guys can you imagine tell me what a t1 losing to bds match looks like it's it's actually inconceivable right like we almost saw that we almost saw that at, at msi uh with g2 right um there were some really close games there but you you literally cannot picture in your mind bds beating a good agent team like that's not that's just actually outside of the realm of possibility. <laughs> you you can't concoct the scenario no, where can't. that would be true. No. <laughs> not the best of three or a best of five. Like you can say, oh, best of one. Here comes Adam's wacky champion pool. Here's Adam's Olaf, and it's winning a game. Like, sure. I give you that one. But over the course of a best of five, no way. No way. Um, so I, I think that's the issue. It's just a it's really just a a talent issue. Uh, with BDS and like sure they're happy I'm sure they're not spending a lot of money on this to get the results that they're getting and that's fabulous for them they're like if you were to look at the team's budgets versus their performance I'm oh, sure BDS is yeah. min maxing like I'm sure BDS and SK yes. are doing great right now so remember dude they've only made one to move in like two years just crowd shot that's it crowd shot for ice <laughs> so, by the way ice must have been cheap he's a nobody so no I get that they're probably killing on I imagine their salaries are very reasonable yeah so. so the results, you're right. The results are insane for what they're spending. Yeah. <laughs> they're all performing like a mother. The problem is we want them to actually be a top three team and fucking show what the West can do, which it seems unlikely it's going to happen, sadly. Also, yeah. by the way, I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm so bored of like people who are fans thinking that because a player is good at the game. You know, they do the opposite normally. They tell us, Monty, we can't know the game because we don't play the game. I'd go the other way. Have you ever actually listened to fucking pro players talk? They're the biggest bozos of all time. Like, bro, there's two things. One, there's an interview you have to see on, like, Sheep Esports that was done with Humanoid after the final. This motherfucker doesn't even live in the same reality as us, mate. Like, he, he's just talking. Like, he's not, like, insanely, like, oh, we're shit. We, what the hell happened? He's just sort of like, I can't believe we lost with those leads. It's like, yeah, go on. Go on. Go on. Continue. Like, that doesn't, that's the point, can't end there, you daft gun. That's what we, if anything, that's the question. How did you lose with those leads? You can't go, yeah, good point. How did we? It, it infers something about you, you bozo. And then the other one is, bro, I saw Adam doing an interview the other day where they asked Adam on, like, fucking uh, e Euphoria, Dracos and Dagda, I think it was, asked Adam, like, who was who were the best top players aside from you, right? This guy, I'm not joking, does he just, does he not even watch League? He just picks the the ones out of Fnatic and fucking um, G2. He just picks Oscar in. And, but like, here's what's weird about that. Does irrelevant not exist? <laughs> Photon doesn't exist. Like these players don't exist to Adam. Because what I don't get about that is this: one, Photon is what Adam wishes he was in lane, and irreverence what Adam wishes he was outside the lane. Like these guys are studs. These guys are giga studs. So if they, if you can't see that, Adam, I think I can see why you're a fucking bozo. Who in my in my analogy, like essentially, I, here's what I actually think that the way it works is basically, Monty. This is the most hurtful but accurate take ever. I'm gonna and I, I'm gonna activate Great. my superpower. 
of seeing the thing that's true but really hurtful. So yeah. what happens is Stryker and the coaching staff of BDS have had to set up BDS like a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> One of those machines where, you know, the ball goes off yes. and hits a card, which goes up into a thing that lights a match, which makes their balloon yeah. go up when the string... Like, they have a yeah. machine like that. And part of the design of the Rube Goldberg machine, Monty, is that Adam will play like an actual brain-dead cretin in the top lane. And that's actually <laughs> factored into how the machine works. Like, that's essentially, true. you know that when you, like, you light, when you light the match that makes the string break on the balloon, you know the stupid balloon will just rise up. That's Adam just pushing lane. You actually factor that in. But then the problem is, when they win the games, this motherfucker, I think, really sits back like this in his chair, like... <laughs> It's nice to be the king, isn't it? You know, what can you do when you're the best? Like, I actually think he thinks he's just like amazing, mate. I think he thinks he's like an elite world class player or something. Like, I don't get it. Like, what's sad is it this actually just shows how I, I am cursed in League of Legends. Because if you ever go back, the moment I did that tweet, Monty, it was in the winter split, like around before the playoffs where he got benched. I did a tweet where I just said, Adam just is like, just like Adam is the best Western top player or something. He like from that moment on, he has just never been the best again. It was one of the most cursed tweets of all time. Because from that moment on, like he got benched immediately, they lost, he got eliminated for the finals. And ever since then, he's just never been as good. Like he was just up and down. So something is. I I think also that's also one of the things I do think holds their team back, bro. It's like I think top lane especially is usually a role where you want someone who actually has a very good sort of reflective mindset, you know, like impact. You think of all the great top lane. Bro, I don't think people realize even the shy actually did go too far. Like those stories are real of them having to like reel him in and tell him like, what are you fucking doing? You can't really play as abusive as Adam tries to in top lane, in my opinion. It'll never work long run, long run, you know. I mean, I think there's a reason why Genji's so good with Keen, and that's because Keen is a really even hand in the top lane. And like top lane is it, it I, I think a lot of people want to be the hero in top lane, yep. but it, you really just have to be the the Swiss RV knife for your team. And like the there's a problem because there's a disconnect thorn between like the way fans perceive top laners and honestly the way top laners are paid. Um, and this is gonna sound crazy, but like people would expect a top laner like Zayas, and I think Zayas' play style leads to higher value contracts, even though I think his play style is objectively worse for teams than Keen's. I think Keen's a better top laner than Zayas because he's more well-rounded and he's more of a team player, but I think it actually hurts his negotiating power when it comes to contracts. Or he's not perceived as the star in the same way, right? Yep, but you don't yeah, have true. to be. Like, I would argue the best top laners... like. Look at 369 last year. It's not that 369 sucks at carrying. It's that he had to play Orn for a year. But he's still really oh. fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know. I mean, I know what you mean, Monty. This is a point I actually made a few years ago, which is that the mistake we all made, because the, the obvious analogy is to jungle as well, is we in with top lane, we just take the Fiora or the Jace player, or in jungle, we take the player who plays Nidalee or Lee Sin, and because they do the flashy carry play, we say that must be the best player at that role. Whereas actually, Monty, as you're saying, the best player is the guy who might not even be a 10 out of 10 carry, but he can do both styles. That way, when the meta flips, in the same way as you might have to play a tank top lane, by the way, the other analogy would be mid lane. If you could only play the assassins and the Silas and you can't play mages, you are in inherently, I can't have, I can't spend the biggest salary in the world on you because we know the meta switch is going to come with the Azir and Corky and the fucking bullshit Oriana. We all know it's coming eventually. So I agree. The actual best player is the one who can play both in theory, isn't it? Come on. Or it's, it's, also, especially. it's also the one that minimizes risk as opposed to, because yeah. like that, this is why the shy became such a fucking meme is because sure he would do crazy outplays, but he would also literally just solo lose games. Yep. And like, you know, it, but as a, as a point about the shy, the shy is one of the most popular players amongst Chinese fans. Why is he the best top later? Fuck. No, he's not. Is he the craziest, most entertaining top later? Yes, he is. But that's not good for his team. It's not good for winning League of Legends games. And it's not good for his teammates. Here's a piece of trivia. I'll ask you a question, Monty. Why would it be very relevant that when we talk about Keen in Gen G, we talk about the Shy? Do you know this piece of... What connects the two? Do you know? No, I don't. You're going to love this. <laughs> you know the one time ever that the Shy won Worlds? Yes. He has the same coach that Keen now has. Oh, really? Coach Kim. 
Oh, interesting. Well, that guy, if you look in his career, clearly is one of the few people who understands it's even his specialty of like how to use top laners. He had QV and Samsung. He had fucking True. the shy here. He had Khan back in Longju. This guy's got an amazing record. I just did a video about it based on my channel, so I just research. But I think that's probably even part of the factor because think about it, right? Keen before this year, he he had the whole. If people don't know, last year he had the whole skill set anyway. He just didn't do it in unfortunately on the matches. Like he, he underperformed in playoffs and the international yes. performance. He's taken that step up. I don't think that's a coincidence. He's got the guy who also worked with all these great top players. He's got the fucking guru, mate. That's the top player whisperer. And he, you know, I think the thing about Keen is that he did actually like carry that game five versus T one in the spring finals. Like he was the big factor there. Uh, so I remember it's he did on carries, he did on fucking Cassante, bro. He literally did what you're talking about. He took the fucking L and took the stupid, I mean, broken, weak side top lane champion and fucking carried with it. I mean, he did both of that series. Also, had banger rumble, right? So, um, you know, he he had a very impressive finals overall. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, banger rumbles. Adam from BD. Oh, no, wait, his is shit. My bad. His is fucking a uh, walk rhyme. My bad. Here, but Adam's better. rumble is the most offensive thing to come out of France in months. And there's a joke there as I'm referencing that opening ceremony for the Olympics or whatever. Like, you know, the biggest desecration of all that Europe holds dear was Adam's rumble, not even that opening last supper, whatever. Um, so yeah, and look, I I think uh, I, I think top lane is like a deeply misunderstood role, uh, especially among fans and even among GMs. And the way that people like view star top laners is like actually really fucked up for who is good and who is most valuable to these teams. It's, it's real weird to me. Well, the joke, the analogy here would be that essentially, like these, the GMs in league are like the person who only looks at like the flashy, you know, basket in basketball or the guy who can do the one little juke wide receiver and get break free. But what you miss is if you actually want to win the championship, you want the cunt that can just dip and dunk all the time or just make a normal basketball shot, you know, without having to be a crazy like double back on yourself, fading. You just mm. want the guy who just hits the open shot. In this analogy, that's what some of the best players do. They just hit the open shot every time. Yeah. Um, well, Guys, I think now is the time before we... Uh, I want to talk about some LCS this week, Thorin. But before we do that, I want to talk about another one of our sponsors on this show for this week. And that, of course, is going to be Raycon. I have my Raycons right here for you guys. Uh, you can see them as well below. Yeah, there you go. Um, so Raycon, if you guys are not familiar, uh, they make some really quite good everyday earbuds. And one of the big points about these is that they are, in fact, significantly cheaper with advanced features uh, that you would expect from other brands. Uh, so they maintain that quality while having a lower price point. I found them to be very good. Uh, the latest iteration of those everyday earbuds does have active noise cancellation in them. Um, so that's a brand new feature. They also have the awareness mode that obviously passes the sound through so you can hear around you at the same time. I've used these on planes uh, when I was flying to and from Korea and the noise cancellation I found to be very effective on those. They are also weatherproof and sweat resistant, which means you could take them to the gym and they're okay. You can tap forward and back and they have all the tap features to change the modes and to uh, you know manipulate the music on your phone or whatever else you have them attached to via Bluetooth. So really nice. They also come in like a bunch of different colors i have the black ones but many many different other ones so if you want to listen to lfn shows while you're working out while you're you know walking around while you're on a plane whatever you're doing go ahead and listen to us on some raycons um so go go to buy raycon.com slash lfn today to get 20 to 40% off site-wide. That's right. You'll get up to 40% off everything on Raycon's website when you go to buyraycon.com slash LFN, buyraycon.com slash LFN. So nice features. I know you've used them too, Thorne. How do you like them? I think they're pretty good. I'll even give an angle I haven't mentioned in the past, which is one thing that makes me very reticent to try newer styles of tech is anything that involves batteries, because obviously you have to keep it charged and you have to sure. know that it's on the right percent. One thing I've noticed is the tech on that stuff in general has gotten way better the last few years. And for oh, stuff yeah. like this, you don't have to put it on for like seven hours on charge to have it ready. Like these things charge so quickly that as long as you like roughly keep your idea of where like the power percentage is, you can recharge it very easily. Like it yeah. just be out the door. Like I actually, I think that aspect's not nothing to worry about nowadays. They've really got way better with that tech. 
Yeah, they, they actually, these have a new, this iteration uh, has a new quick charge function that does 10 minutes of charging with 90 minutes of battery. So if you forgot, it's Eagle. pretty easy to rectify that mistake. And they have a 32 yep. hour battery life to start off with. Um, obviously, like the the headphones charge in the case, like a lot of other ones as well. So yep. you charge up the battery in the case, recharge <laughs> from there while you're on the go. So good stuff, guys. Because I'm sure you've had the same thing, Monty. Like, think about how much we used to travel back in the day. Like, the worst thing ever is when you come to pick up, like, your headphones and they're like, oh, I didn't charge them. And you're about to go to the place. Yeah. The joke here is literally, even in the airport for 10 minutes, that's all you need, mate. You get like yep. 20, 10, 20 minutes and you're going to be you're gonna be laughing at that point. So it's really easy to do. I, I, like I say, that's why I picked up that feature. I think it's like an underrated, like, daily like use feature. Yeah, oh, I yeah. like it. So thank you very much to Raycon for your sponsorship. We appreciate it. Um, Head over to buyrecon.com, um, code LFM. So let's talk about some LCS, Thorin, because um, I, ha I have to get this off my chest. I think Cloud9 is incredibly fraudulent. I think this team is actually really bad. <laughs> and uh, the reason why they haven't been exposed is because of the new format in best of threes, where they somehow have avoided playing FlyQuest and Team Liquid until the very last two weeks of this regular split. So they're sitting on top of the league. They've lost one game, but in every single game they win, they have looked terrible doing it. And the one game was to dig who didn't turn out to be as good as people hoped. So the problem is even the one game they've lost is an indictment of like the fact that they look sus as fuck. And we, uh... <laughs> but it's also like the way that teams play against them. Like, and, our, and by the way, the other thing is all of those teams that they have lost to guys. So four that they've beaten four beaten. out of those yeah. five teams have a one in four record. We literally have half the league right now has a one in four record and NRG after playing C9 is two and three. Meanwhile, Cloud9 five and O, Team Liquid five O, FlyQuest four and one. And like, you could reverse this position, Thorne, and you could say, well, you know, well, obviously Team Liquid and FlyQuest haven't played Cloud9 yet and everyone else sucks. So they've had a weak strength of schedule too. Oh. It's also just the eye test because Cloud9, they just look bad. They're picking compositions that in my mind don't make like a lot of sense so they'll like b1 nidalee and then they'll just go ahead and take like nar azir ezreal alistair right now nar nidalee is probably the worst anti-dive team of all time if you get bullied in that top side and they start diving nar in the top lane early nidalee cannot stop tower dives to be very clear and nar is terrible and like you absolutely one thousand percent you know, could be in these games where the Nidalee pick, which doesn't make a lot of sense, doesn't have a lot of synergy with these compositions. And frankly, Blabber misses tons of Nidalee spears and skill shots on this champion. Like, you, you would not know this from his KDA, but the eye test makes Cloud9 just look super bad. Like this team. Oh, bro, that's one of the things I can't even handle. Like, as you said earlier, if you go watch that Razork playoff game on Nidalee, that was fire. That was why I do think Razork is the only player, like, inspired a year or two ago that I think is on the level of the Koreans at jungle. Because the difference is when Blabber locks in Nidalee, Monty, all I think to myself is, holy fuck, no one can punish this. Like, he's leaving holes all over the place. Like, bro, this guy would get destroyed in the LPL. I'm telling you, he would never make it. <laughs> Well, it's also just things like, like okay, so, money at least, you know, so like that. you pick a Nidalee comp that has no Nidalee setup, and what happens, Thorn? Oh, Palafox just walks into Top River and just gives Blabber a kill for no reason in laning phase. So I'm like, well, I guess you don't need setup when Palafox is literally just going to walk into River, blow his slash, and die anyway, and Blabber just gets killed. Very cool. You know what I mean? And it's like Cloud9 is winning because the other teams are just so fucking bad that it's almost impossible for Cloud9 to lose. They're like Fnatic, except Fnatic actually wins the games, right? Teams int into them, and then they win the game. And this is in spite of all of these myriad flaws. So, for example... Thanatos looks like he has no idea what the rest of his team is doing at any given point in time. I don't even think it looks like he has he, no comms at all. It does. I, I I don't even think individually he's bad. I just think like he has oh, no God, clue God. how to communicate with his teammates, and his team doesn't communicate with him. And I thought by this point in time, after having three fucking weeks off to fix some of these problems, I thought now they've got Reaper. You know they'll get in there and fix it. Reaper can speak Korean. Fabulous. No, he just has no idea. His team doesn't even know 
and this isn't a problem, guys, of his like language difference. He can learn how to say no TP, but his team is just fighting when he doesn't have TP up or is not able to TP because he might get CC'd or for various other reasons. His individual play has been fine, but dear Lord, like his coordination with this team. And what is the excuse? Because frankly, over there on FlyQuest, we see the pretty notable improvement in Quad's ability to play with FlyQuest. So it's some teams are doing a better job of integrating than others, but he just feels like he's really still on an island, has no idea what's happening. So there's this constant like split. There's this constant disconnect. And NRG just fucking ran it down with, I mean, especially in game two against Cloud9. Holy shit. NRG managed to get a comp of Rumble, Vi, Tristana. Yes, it's nerfed Tristana. The Jin and the Rel. This is a very strong composition with insane setup. Rumble is still banned on this patch in Asia, by the way, guys, in spite of the minor Rumble nerfs that occurred. Rumble is still like 100% red side banned. It's just getting let through left and right. It falls all the way through draft in LCS. It's outrageous. This champion is fucking busted still. NRG gets it, of course, doesn't do anything. Immediately ends the game, loses in 26 minutes. Like, Cloud9 is such... They are so fraudulent. It's outrageous, Thor. And like, this is a team that I want to be good. I thought at the start of this year, the Cloud9 roster was going to be one that might be able to contest with fourth seeds, third seeds from Asia, but they've never had the shot calling. They've never had the teamwork. And I, like, I don't even like the drafts that they're doing. And it's like, they're winning with this Nidalee, but they don't even play Nidalee well. Oh, and I think it's sad. Like the worst thing is, in in many ways, everything people hoped the Thanatos signing would fix hasn't e even vaguely addressed it. Like it's still just a bunch of individuals. And I agree with you as well. They're not even able to use the tools in the meta right now, which they're getting all day long. Because think about this, Monty. By default, C9 should never be able to lose draft. Every single carry player, in theory, is among the best at their role. So you can never, ever not have a power pick. You'd always have a tool that should win you the game, but they're not very good at using those tools. Like, yeah, I, I think the problem is, this is why I actually do just want to skip to the fucking finals and have them play Team Liquid in a BO5. Like, if Team Liquid surely is tailor-made to just fucking neutralize all this oh, shit and just beat these guys straight up with, with real League of Legends, you know what I mean? Oh, they will destroy so these guys. Gonna happen. Like, Cloud9 is a team with no shot calling. None. Um, so, I mean, I... I I struggle to see how they're going to beat FlyQuest. Like, I, I think if you look at the, the kind of the scope of the LCS right now, like FlyQuest did play a very bad 100 Thieves team uh, in, in a closer series, as in it was two to one, although FlyQuest did just like brutally murder them in the third game of the series. And the first game, the thing is, is that a lot of the problems with FlyQuest have kind of gone away. So Masu and Busio, I'm waiting till we see playoffs Busio, obviously, because playoffs and international Busio has been horrendously bad. Whereas, you know, regular season Busio has been okay to good at times. But he's definitely, like, it feels like with FlyQuest, their younger players are learning. Masu and Busio have gotten a lot better. They don't create, like, giant fucking mistakes in the early game as much anymore that warps the entire game state. So, you know, Quad is now much better integrated into this team. Even the game they lost to 100 Thieves, which they did very stupidly by, like, getting Quad ahead. So they had a really good early game plan, which FlyQuest often does, where... They have kind of a script of how they're going to play their composition. And this one, Quad is on the Lucian mid. He's dominating Quid, uh, who's on this Zeri. And then they're switching him to the side lanes, feeding him all this plate gold. And so they're able to, like, get this Lucian very strong. And then, Thorin, they just fight a million team fights without Quad and lose the game. Like, they literally just, like, 3v5, 4v5 over and over without the fed Lucian, and they lose. Um, Which is also can say if you don't know guys right now over in Asia, Lucian's fucking body games when really good <laughs> mid laners get them. That's such a powerful champion. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's the Chovy effect, right? It's like bringing it out and then dominating within this. I mean, Chovy's now playing Draven mid, so who the fuck knows what's going on with Chovy? He just does whatever he wants. But um, I mean, it has been a big pick in Europe in the mid lane as well. Um, but in any case, like. This game, like, the way FlyQuest loses a lot of the time is that Bwipo decides he needs to be a superhero. And I don't know what goes on in this guy's mind where he just can't lose gracefully. 
right? It's like he loses a, a very dumb solo kill. So he is fighting Sniper in the top side in game one. Sniper obviously very good in lane and very good at these 1v1 kills. He actually, I was watching this game back on my stream and he gets baited into this top side all in basically where Sniper still has a biscuit. So it appears that Sniper doesn't have enough mana to use Counter-Strike on Jax. He, he pops the biscuit, gets a burst of mana and then does. So Whipple gets like, basically mind gamed and it's pretty funny and yes sniper like gets the kill but th at that point in time whippo could absolutely just choose to play passively on cassante you know what i mean no instead he has to like strap on the fucking cape and be the hero of this game and the hero of this game means oh i see this angle but whippo it's a 4v5 and your lucian which is fed is in top lane it doesn't matter i'm going in and whippo just oh, solo throws this game like all he had to do was be a passenger on the fucking quad express and it would have been fine. But no, he couldn't do that. So like the concerns about FlyQuest that I have right now is like when Bwipo starts to lose or Bwipo feels like he needs to be the main character, he actually just ruins games. I mean, the problem is, if you look at past teams he was in, it, the reason I think he was more unbalanced is he used to have the other stars at mid lane and ADC. I don't believe that he thinks that the fucking mid lane is the shit. He doesn't treat that mid laner like it's Bjergsen or Nemesis or Cap. He doesn't bro. He just doesn't. Like you say, <laughs> he, he actually thinks he's got main character syndrome now. He thinks he's the fucking the shit. He thinks he's going to yep. carry the game. And like... It, it, he he has a good game on Darius in the third game of that series. But also, I think that's a condition oh. of the fact that why the fuck doesn't 100 Thieves lane swap? Like, they literally should 1,000% lane swap in that situation where the Darius doesn't have teleport. And so it becomes really unplayable. Not to mention that they were losing bot lane in the 2v2. So there was literally no downside to lane swapping. Do they do, do, they do the lane swap? Nah. You know, I mean, 100 of these is like next level bad, which look now their players are we, we've gotten to we've gotten to the point where players are now benching themselves like Meech. It came out that Meech has now benched himself and like Tomo is coming in and all this other shit like the teams are doing so bad that the players and the the, the, the team play around 100 of these is so miserable that the players can't even survive like one single best of three round robin anymore. Although I might bench myself if I had to play with Ayla as well. That guy is trash. <laughs> no one knows. No one knows what his secret is. I just want to know what dark fucking technology does he have to stay on these teams? I don't get it, man. I don't get it. He's doing some of though. I mean, hundred these is also just incredibly fraudulent as a team. Like the fact that Quid got MVP of Spring is going to age so badly, guys. So badly. How could the MVP of Spring be performing this poorly to the degree that 100 Thieves is now a 1 and 4 team? Like, Inspired was actually robbed in Spring. It is crazy. What, what, what is happening? Yeah, what, like, what is happening with the league voting where we thought that Quid was, like, literally the best player in the LCS? Like you just uh, like I think uh, by it's the way, just that it's that stupid thing where they they have the expectations set so low that then when they have the carry games you go oh my god and you overrate exactly. the guy you know what I mean but but here's the, here's the other thing that's wacky about the LCS because the LCS is all about narratives these days Thorin if it's all about narratives where is the narrative about like any sport any American sport would be all over quid why the fuck is the mvp so oh, bad it's like the entire focus Lamar of the league Jackson. would be about this Think about that. yeah of course of course yeah but it's literally the, that's literally the only thing anybody would be talking about in a real sport is yes. why is oh, you'd quid be crucified if you were this on guy. a one and yeah. four team why is he playing so shit why is this guy so terrible after just coming off an mvp split just fucking crickets man it's almost like everybody agrees he didn't deserve it it's almost like that's the case because otherwise like you should be shitting on a hundred thieves like i hate this hundred thieves roster i hate the fact that sniper looks good in lane has no fucking clue how to use teleport in these games although i think he accidentally had a good teleport in one of the games versus in game one on the jacks versus fly quest but really no ability to play macro whatsoever like the, as soon as quid has been denied champions that could just dominate the laning phase he started out strong on some of these mid-Ezreal picks, and then once that was taken away, he's done absolutely nothing. 
Like if Hundred Thieves doesn't massively smash lane, they do not have a leg to stand on. And even sometimes when they do smash lane, they lose because their their mid and late game macro is so terrible. Like this team is just uniquely bad. Um, and like even, at least Shopify was able to like gin mid their way to a 2-0 over Dignitas. At least they have some life in them still. Like Shopify looks like they're on the up and up. Hundred Thieves looks like they're just never going to be good. And Quid is like one of the most fraudulent, if not the most fraudulent MVP in LCS history. Because otherwise you're basically like, this guy, like explain to me if he was the MVP, how he, at like how he fell off so hard and how 100 Thieves fell off so hard with this split. How did it happen? No, I'm with you. Almost every single case I can think in major sports, Monty, that is literally the dominant narrative. The same concept, by the way, in the NBA, when fucking uh, Joel Embiid won the MVP, everyone's like, where is he in the playoffs? What the hell? Where is the, where is the MVP? Oh, it's supposed to be the best. But I agree. They not only don't crucify the guy, they just let him skate. Like as far as, it, and, and the weirdest thing of all is, dude, all the narratives on that team make no sense. So if you remember, in that first split, another factor that helped them was like, initially Sniper looked really promising, didn't he? He had like those interesting picks. He would have carry games. He was, sometimes he would perform better than you expect, right? He didn't, uh, the trajectory didn't keep going up. He, he himself, he's even said it on Twitter. He knows his game's worse. He knows he's worse. But you have to, when do you ever call the team out? Like this team, I agree. The problem is people act like they were always supposed to be also runs, but they weren't. The actual narrative's last split where this was going to be a dark horse in the playoffs or something and, and maybe do something. They didn't, but that was like what people were hoping for. Maybe it was copium. Who knows? Well, I mean, people were hyped because they finished the split in second place. By the way, looking extremely fraudulent the whole time. Like they never actually looked like a good team that could play League of Legends. Um, you know, you know, to the credit, like Team Liquid, in fact, did end up, you know, seven and seven. Like they were not a good team when the playoffs started and they ended up actually winning the entire split. Right. And that was a big uh, that was a big upset. And it was at the start of the playoffs and it was a massive glow up by Team Liquid to get into that position. But they were actually improving as a team, whereas 100 of these basically stayed at one level, kind of showed that they were never going to be good. And then as other teams got better they just failed to improve and here we are where they're now one in four and not even looking like it's going to be like it, it really could be just a one win split for them i mean they play immortals and shopify rebellion next so we'll see i guess it's a bunch of other teams that are one and four they probably lose at least one of those right i don't think they beat both shopify and cool. immortals and even if they do there's uh, like they still have to have a little bit of luck i think to get into the playoffs we'll see They're just it a fundamentally whack team. I mean, this <laughs> this team for real is like a three-team region. And even then, it's just, can anyone beat TL? That's it. That's just the only story. Yeah. And and I think the problem with having the single round Robin is the exactly the same problem that have the, having the single round Robin was an LPL. It just sucks. Like the format. People are mad at the LEC format. You guys should be mad at this fucking shitty LCS format. LPL oh, switched away from single best of three round Robin. Because it was terrible. Because you didn't get any good matches. And now we just got banger after banger in the LPL. And it's wonderful. You know, th this format is no good. You could say, well, they can't do it because they have, you know, there's only eight teams in this league. Well, not for, I mean, we'll, we'll see how they rearrange things if it goes according to plan or not. But this is, you know, it's just, this league is just not fun to watch. And everybody was talking about, ooh, LCS is so fun because of the parody in spring. How's that parody now? Is it fun to watch now? No, it's not like I like it better with best of threes, but a lot of these games are just like meaningless. And I literally have had to sit through like this league started on June 16th. It is now the beginning of August almost. And cloud nine has yet to play a worthy opponent. That is insane. Yeah, watch, I'll, I'll give you a rundown. Here's why this split is quite underwhelming from LCS, actually. It's basically just the Team Liquid story. If Team Liquid ends up being good, it will sort of like justify slash redeem or how whack these narratives are. Think of the like, think of the league coming into this split, Monty. So first of all, you had all those massive moves from Dig where they brought in people like Licorice that we all want to see play again and Sven and Jensen, all the speaker, all these players we all know can be good. So you hope, right? Look, they don't even have to be a contender, but you hope, right? At least make it like a good dark horse. Make them like the fourth best team. If make them the fourth best team. We're sort of cooking, right? Then you look at the rest of the league. 100 Thieves just had that fraudulent run, but everyone was hyping them. So we've got 100 Thieves supposed to be in the mix too. NRG used to be really 
really good. They obviously, at one point in time, you go back eight, nine months, they were a very good team. So you hope, right, they're going to be competent. Shopify Rebellion, if you haven't watched the last year of League of Legends, would inexplicably just win games. They were kind of a fun... It's the reason we've mentioned them so many times on this show. They were just a fun team to watch. Yeah, like, fun. who didn't watch, like, some weird fucking insanity pick that they just try and make work? You go and look, right, all of a sudden... That's almost the whole league. Like, this could have been a really stacked league. This could be really fun. But instead, almost all those narratives have fallen flat or just dead or never made it. Never never, never survived the fucking birthing room, Monty. Like, they just died on the fucking slab. Like, there's, only, there's two and a half teams in this league. It's actually whack, isn't it? It's fucking whack. Yeah. And, and by the way, we haven't seen most of those two and a half teams actually play each other yet. Because Cloud9 right, hasn't played joke. anybody good. <laughs> The reason you can't do the LPL move, Monty, which is to separate the good teams from the bad, is there's not enough good teams. So at this point, yes. it's like the it's like you just do have they're just all in the bad group. It's like you just took the top three LPL teams, put them into the Nirvana <laughs> group, and they just play the shitters every week. But it doesn't even matter. I'm with you. It's just whacking it. Also, low key, I do think the most obvious look, they're doing the America's pivot now. The reason I also would have considered a change in the format for um, North America Monty is I think North America would have been the most obvious region to experiment with something like <sighs> a semi open circuit and have like events and stuff. Because, bro, wouldn't you rather see like an event where Team Liquid plays C9 to see? If they win this week i'd rather see that I, like a I mean, one and also open it up don't have these teams like uh, if these teams are gonna be this bad at the bottom Monty, i guarantee someone could make a challenger team with players that could be better than this they could they could compete if this was an open land like an iem there's some team could come and actually do something i'm telling you we, we we could have just had two gsl groups and like run run that format twice within this time oh. frame and then actually had just like a, a final between the winners of each group and I, I didn't do the math on how long that would take, but I'm I'm pretty sure we could shove all of that in the seven weeks of competition. Um, and it would have been more interesting because it would have felt like we were building to something and I would have been excited to see some of these games. Um, I mean, I look, the one nice thing you can say about this is the, ne the next two weeks are going to be very impactful because those Cloud9 games versus Liquid and TL are going to probably decide playoff seating and playoff buys, right? Because the, the first... The, the, you get a you get the you get the uh, the buy if you're in the top two. So those will be very important matches. So we had to deal with a lot of downside, but at least the end will be exciting. But there's no guarantee in a round robin format that that's going to be the case ever. Like most of the time in the history of League of Legends, like by the last couple of weeks, the the seeds are pretty much locked up for playoffs, and this it's rare that you actually have this kind of like last minute run. But it's not. It's not very fun, and it it really is painful to watch Cloud Nine like not even play good League of Legends and be five and zero and ten and one in games. <laughs> I I just feel like I'm going crazy because I look at their 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 uh, their standings and I think I'm watching this team play really badly, right? And I feel like I'm going crazy. <laughs> Here's where they actually got lucky, Monty, because obviously EWC was just the MSI team, so C9 never had to go. Bro, if they'd have had to go with this lineup to EWC, they would have been murked. I don't even care if they'd have played Fnatic. They would have lost. They would lose to Fnatic. <laughs> it's definitely possible. Like It depends on, obviously, the, the Jekyll and Hyde of Fnatic. Do we get the upper bracket beating G2 iteration or, you know, the throwing in the finals iteration. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I think this cloud nine project is unfortunately, you know, I think also a big part of it that isn't being talked about with cloud nine is basically like they went down to one coach. They had Mythy and then now they just have Reaper, but they don't have any, like this isn't one of those cloud nine rosters where you have all these assistant coaches and you have the, the, the Academy team and you have their coaches too. Like cloud nine just basically cut all of their infrastructure. And I think that's a huge part of why the performance is the way it is. I agree with getting Reaper, like going and getting him is probably the best bang for your buck that you're going to get in terms of a single coach in this situation with a group of players, including a young Korean rookie. Uh, but I think it's really hard to do this with like such a bare bones coaching staff compared to other teams like Team Liquid and FlyQuest that are much more robust on the on the infrastructure front at this point in time. I think Cloud9 spent all their money NRG, on JoJo. Last year, when NRG did that thing where they had positional coaches yes. for everyone, and then they even integrated like challenger people, so like they became like eight coaches or something mental. Bro, they did that with like a sort of scoffed roster. Imagine what you could do if you had a set of coach like that with this roster. Like this, are, these are all the players, bro. You could do a lot with this team.
Well, I, I mean, I think the I think the North American owners, for the most part, like as a whole, when it comes to LCS, are playing this very conservatively. Because why would you overspend money right now when the future is so unclear? My understanding, Thorin, is that LCS budgets, like the stipends, are going to be cut for next year. And so they don't want to be left with a bunch of contracts that they end up having to pay out or buy out or what have you. And then on top of that, you know, I, I find it difficult to believe based on Riot's plans. Like they've said they want to cut to six teams. So some teams are going to get bought out. So why spend money right now, right? Especially if you're a bottom team or you want to exit this league, what the fuck is the point in spending money on coaches or players? Like you're just going to run minimum, pick up like as much profit as you can, and then just sell your slot back to Riot. I know that was a rhetorical question, but the, the actual answer is because this is what we do and have chosen to do and is our purpose in life. So to be excellent at it would have value whether or not there would be a financial reward or, or not, you know. Well, but you see, I know that Thorin, sounds like a very naive sort of answer there, Monty, but I, that's what I believe. You see, Thorin, it, the, the competitive drive and the competitive fire, that exists in the players in lieu of money um, because right. the players are the ones okay. who get screwed in that situation, not the orgs. The orgs aren't going to spend the money. Like, it's up to the players to, you know, make up for their lack of payment through sheer force of will on the competitive front. Um, it's okay though because the players got massively overpaid previously so they can suck it up for a little bit and by the way isn't it in many ways the ultimate indictment of the lcs project to tie back into the whole nas thing from earlier on and all the riot picking themselves up that if next year indeed two teams want to exit monty they will literally have gone from launching the lcs in 2013 with 10 teams to having six teams in the lcs like 12 years <laughs> later on some of mental like that like how do you fuck up that badly that meanwhile remember bro i'll just add this detail remember when franchising was first announced g2 wanted to sell their european slot which is now a dynasty sprawling the ages and come to lcs because at the time everyone wanted an lcs slot in fact if you don't know the bigger context because lcs was so much better priced and a better prospect than the overwatch league at the time everyone wanted an lcs slot. Like it yep. was actually seen to be the most guaranteed slam dunk slot to buy so oh, that was only guys was really i see by the way, here's the joke. I'll make the really cruel connection. Before you go, Thorin, that was ages ago. That was in 2018. Yes, Fnatic fans. A lot of things happened a long time ago in 2018 that I don't think are relevant anymore. But, you know, that's just how it works, isn't it? Yeah, long time ago, wasn't it? 2018. Yes. yes. <laughs> but, you know, and the, the other the other funny thing is, like, the, stats, the, the slot started at 10 million if you were already in the league yep. and 12 million to buy in from outside. Then they went up to like 30 million with which EG bought in for. I mean, frankly, fuck EG. Yep. They deserve to lose that money based on what they did. Uh, but, you know, by the time it, EG... it, listen, if you hit the orcs, it is beautiful how much evil geniuses and Carmen caught bought into these leagues for that is oh, oh I love it oh bro, if they even waited like two years you get like a like a like an eighty percent discount but they got they got actually wrecked on those sales didn't they it's true. yeah it's true. I, I, you're not wrong like literally an eighty percent discount eg bought in for thirty million they left the league for six literally twenty percent. Of the money Not that they paid to get into Not this league. <laughs> Imagine, uh, by the way, there's one reason I wish esports was more like real sports, Monty. I want someone to have like a PowerPoint presentation like that when you come into an interview. Like, uh, excuse me, didn't you oversee a thing where you bought in for 40 million? And I see you sold here for six. Um, how did that? Can you explain that to me? There's sort of a gap hey, in the, hey, in the, uh, Chris, in the Chris Greeley, there. can you tell me like what happened from 2018 when you started as commissioner to now? And like, why was there this massive depreciation of value, Mr. Commissioner? Hello? Hello, Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> can't make these people up. Then he probably just went to his lawyer like, make up some semantic shit to get me out of this. Uh, we can't, Chris. This is just about real hard numbers. Oh, shit. <laughs> He'd probably just do something like, no, it, my joke would be, since he's Chris Grealish, right, the obvious only angle that he could go with is, he'd do something like, what do you mean? That wasn't me. I am Christopher Greeley. You know, <laughs> that was Chris Greeley. I'm Grizzer on Twitter who did all of that. Like, go, go talk to him if you've got a problem. Yeah, he'd probably just do some semantic get out like that again, because that's his whole game, apparently. His whole game. <laughs> I love how stupid it is.
<laughs> By the way, low key, part of me knows that I'll be so triggered if they actually do just make MSI like EWC, but not call it MSI or EWC money. Because even though we would be totally right again, all the fans would be like, no, but he did technically say it wasn't going to be ever. They, they'd all just do, they'd just play into his bullshit game he's already set up. I just know we'd lose again. Even though we'd that's win in because, spirit, we'd lose that's by the only end because of the people, people always just take the worst possible aspect because they don't, they're like, I don't like Thorin and Monty. How do I justify the fact that they were right again, but I, I can't possibly admit it so they just you know straw man whatever <laughs> as a result i mean one thing i've always found funny along those lines monty is if i collectively gather together all the people telling me heartbreaking the worst person you know just made a good point well collectively you're all telling me all my points are right you fucking moron maybe if all my points are right collectively among all of you in the one area you don't have a blind spot you can all jam right maybe i'm just fucking sick of what i do and you're biased i don't know it sort of seems like that's the pattern emerging here guys Fucking hell. Because I, I love the way people have actually gone so mad from social media that they do just think parasocially everything in, on the whole world is just about them, Monty. Like, you'll have probably noticed this. I bet you get the same thing. I can't put my finger on when I fell off and became irrelevant or a toxic piece of shit and no one likes me. Because as far as I can tell, it's always just whatever moment in the heart of the one particular fan, he stopped liking me. The second he stopped, it wasn't just him, Monty. The whole world stopped like, it's like the hundred monkey syndrome as soon as 10 of these can't stop liking me everyone apparently stopped like and the reason i say i can't put my finger on it is because collectively again it's my entire career it's like apparently in 2003 i was killing esports in 2005 i was a piece of shit in 2008 i'm a sellout in 2012 you know it never ends like I, I, so i've had a 20 plus year career in the meantime i've been falling off the whole time like you know yeah. that saying like you know like i'm dying since i was born like that's me in esports i've just been i've been By both killing esports and myself becoming irrelevant for 20 plus years I, I do also want to point out that people who are saying that you were a net negative to esports are now those same people selling out to it. Saudi Arabia as if that is in some sort of like massive net negative for the entire, I don't know, not just industry, but humanity ethics of the west i don't know <laughs> no i'll never get old for me the same people who were like it's it's white men like this guy who was stopping women wanting to get an esports uh you now work with men who stop women living and breathing oxygen you fucking can't like don't ever talk to me another second in your life and the worst part of it all is this monty people think it's only now i get to have like they get their come up and so i can call them out i knew the whole time they never had any moral authority to stand on these were always by the way I'll tell you what's aged beautifully, but no one will ever acknowledge it because it was part of my unhinged rant at the end of 2021. Do you remember, Monty, when I pointed out that if women in esports don't like people like me who've gone out of our way to help the best examples of them over and over and over again? Well, you know what I basically said to the rest of the industry is just full of like sex pests and cynical like pricks. <laughs> Mate, everyone dunked on me like I was mad for saying that. Bro, these Dr. District, that's like, those aren't even rare for fuck's sake. That is like the open secret in the fucking industry of people who are like that. Like, that is the industry we're in, guys. So, again, it's why it's such, it's why the saddest thing about that is, you know what the mechanism is? The mechanism online is this, Monty. If you just make your point like, hey, here's a point and it's a good point and here's a reason. There's nothing sexy about that. The drama is what carries the point. So what you have to do is you have to make the tone of your drama comment as hysterical as possible. So it can't just be like, I disagree with Thorin on philosophical matters, and I think that the way he's behaving is not how I would want the industry to be. Instead, it's like, he's something and, and harming the whole world, and he, this guy is falling, this guy is falling, this guy, I'm on fire, I'm on fire! Like that, and then you, you just, I just did a tweet or something, or like the tweet or something, you know. Or even better, it was when nutters, like... The, guy, the, the West one ever was the guy who used to work for Riot, Monty, who used to just take screenshots of retweets I did. Not even my tweets, just retweets. Like, look, he just retweeted that. Look at it. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm like, um, you know, over there, they're just about to behead like 100 women. Look, he retweeted a tweet. It's like, uh, you, you can't win you, against you, that. You know, you know at Riot, what a, they, the, the state industry. of California actually like fined you guys like $100 million for the rampant misogyny within your company. I don't know what's worse, making a tweet of that. Who know? Who can know? Who can know? I also just <laughs> never get over the idea no one was ever fired to this day. I'll, I'll never, that, somehow that is the part I'll never get because what I don't get about that is, bro, even scumbag polit political figures do the scapegoat. You know what I mean? Even they kick one guy out. You just pick one guy that's the most compromised. They couldn't, eat, the joke is in Riot, they couldn't find one C-suite exec who they could just fire that wouldn't just burn the whole place down yep. like, <laughs> that's what an actual shit is your first riot is for fuck's sake like the joke there is that must mean that they're on some next level
travel. They're, they're on some like fucking, you're know, like fucking, they're off in a grove somewhere doing <laughs> ceremonies or something. What the fuck is going on at Riot Games, bro? What is going on? <laughs> like the stone cutters at the Simpsons, like, oh, the holy riot cult here. Like, <laughs> Chris Greeley's probably there. Like Temple of Doom ripping someone's heart out metaphorically in a video game Minecraft. This is not real. Twitch TOS all covered, all legit. A one man play it, me about Chris Reed, whatever. It's all good. We're back. We're back in the room. We're back in the room. Uh on that note, I do want to talk about LCK a little bit. Uh obviously, some yeah. interesting matches that have happened, but we've got another sponsor for you guys this episode. HelloFresh is back for you guys. Uh we've had HelloFresh before. Um, they are the same company. As our other sponsor, Factor. Uh, so we like them both. They are for different things, however. If you want the pre-made meals, Factor is your game. If you want to learn how to cook, for example, HelloFresh is wonderful. I used HelloFresh um, extensively uh, before I left the United States. Um, so whenever I go back, I'm sure I'll be back on HelloFresh. I found a really fun way to kind of mix up my meal planning. Um, does take some of the load off of you when you're planning out your meals for the week because they send you that box with all the ingredients. You only need a few things like butter and oil, like salt and pepper. Otherwise, they send you spice packets, you know, garlic, aromatics. These kind of things are already in there along with the protein, carbohydrates, whatever you need to make these meals. They have a cool little recipe card that they send you so you can actually teach yourself how to cook. Or if you're already a good cook like me, sometimes it's fun because you get to try new things that you might not normally make but sound good, expand your skill set, as well as like kind of unburden yourself of a lot of that shopping and now they have their biggest menu ever so they have over 50 recipes every week and even more market items these are snacks desserts things you can add on into your box they send you on a weekly basis they also have like fit and wholesome recipes um that are like a lot of fresh produce they're under 650 calories per serving you have options for various different um you know, like meal plans. If you're vegetarian, they'll have options for that. So really good stuff. I enjoyed having it very much. I have used this product extensively well before we even got sponsored by it. So I can testify to it um, from my really own personal choices and experiences, which is great. Um, so you can go to HelloFresh.com slash LFN apps. That's LFN A-P-P-S for free appetizers for life. One appetizer item per box while your subscription is active. That's free appetizers for life at HelloFresh.com slash LFN apps for America's number one meal kit. Um, so very enjoyable. If you guys want to learn how to cook, I know I have also been doing cooking streams. So I know many of you have been watching those. So I know you are interested in cooking or learning how to cook, given the questions that I've gotten on some of the cooking streams I've run on my own channel. Um, I also have done cooking streams in the past when I was in the States using HelloFresh products, in fact. Um, so it's been fun. Would recommend uh, whether you are a new or experienced cook. Great products. I look forward to using it again. So thank you to HelloFresh. Let's dive into some of the LCK shenanigans from this past week um we did in fact uh you know have a, a telecom war that occurred we had a you know the continuing fall of Guangdong freaks um we had hanwa versus d plus which was kind of like a battle for second best team uh over in the lck which hanwa won viper even though he probably had a worse week this week than he did the past couple of weeks, still continues to like look really good. I talked on the Monty and Wolf show, if you guys want to check that out. Wolf and I had a long conversation about, like, is Viper the MVP of the LCK this season? Right? You think you could make some pretty compelling arguments that that's the case? It's an insane year in general, if you think about it. It's just never stopped cooking, mate. Yep. Um, and, like, Hanwha just feels, like, really well-suited to this meta. Like, out of all the kind of LCK teams like peanut feels like the Ivern player, like the pathing guy, the, the, the guy who's going to be able to do more with kind of this weird champion in the game that is very strong right now and being played around the world. Um, so HLE really fun to watch. Zekka's having some good performances. Uh, ever since they changed Corky, he doesn't have the Corky pitfalls anymore. Um, but D plus also at the same time. Now, as we were recording this, guys, uh, they did, in fact, lose to T1. So I haven't seen those games yet. Uh, so we won't be talking about them this week. But, you know, one thing that's really fun about 
LCK as we we head into the end of the split is it feels like each of these teams really has their own unique identity at the time being Thorin like D plus is like well we're gonna play we're gonna be the only team in the world that plays AP Twisted Fate oh right we're gonna bring out the support poppy a la G2 and we're gonna like have Showmaker on LeBlanc and um, I saw earlier today against T1, I haven't seen the game yet, but I saw that he was playing some Silas. So there's definitely some interesting picks. And it feels like a lot of these teams are really like honing in on their own identities. And it's been, it's been cool to watch. It's been cool to watch. Like Han was, you know, back in the Viper carry camp of like Ezreal and Zeri and Kaisa, and he's been having these mega games and it's great. So like the upper the upper uh tier battles in this league are really fun to watch right now. No, the funny thing is, I know a lot of people the entire year have never been in on D plus because if you just look at the roster on paper, it's just not that crazy a roster. Like you look at it, you're like, who gives a fuck about King? And no one knew except people who watched Challenger apparently that Lucid was good. By the way, he is he actually is a good player. He's getting much uh, better. Obviously too. aiming. I actually think aiming was always unfairly maligned on KT because I think people just remember the throws and they don't remember how many times like he was the one fucking win condition in some of those 38 minute sure. games or whatever. And then Kellen, look, deserves to be a meme, but actually he's had like a fucking glow up. Like he's actually had some pretty good times. And and, yeah. I, and also everyone probably thought if you separate Canyon from Showmaker, isn't Showmaker going to be washed? I mean, if anything, he seems like he's had his bounce back. Like he sort of got his mental back together again. He's actually pretty good. So no, this, the joke is, where is KT's lineup is actually worse than it looks on paper. This is better than it looks on paper. Like, D-plus isn't bad, bro. They're not a bad team at all. Yeah, it, I mean, a lot of the criticism you could have is with some of their shot calling. I mean, with any aiming team, you're always going to have aiming problems. And that is that he is just he's just incredibly expensive. Like, he is the win condition, especially in strong ADC metas with a lot of these, like, hyper carries. But, he, you know, the thing about aiming is he absolutely can deliver on that front, right? You yep. know, people will rightly criticize him for some of his like egregious ints and he does have the brain fart and the problem is when he dies he takes your entire team's bag of gold with him uh because he takes so much farm he is literally like the highest economy player in the entire league when it comes to gold percentage of cs like all of these factors oh it's greedy as fuck yeah yes and the team has to play around that but you know the upside is is that he actually also does hard carry games at times and you want to see something entertaining yep. go watch the last couple of games of the hanwha life series and aiming almost just fucking yep. destroys oh, it's just hard, he? like he yeah. he dies but in the for that one Monty, i actually i actually had a bet for that game on fucking hanwha and i can tell you i was fucking sweating bullets in that third game of course like it looked like this guy was going to be the hero and win the and fucking carry on kaiser yeah uh, and, you know, he very nearly right did. There. I mean, people will criticize him for, like, yep. the, the arm guard usage in that last fight, but that is such a hard fight to play. And, you know, um, oh. I don't even know if what he did necessarily was the wrong thing. Like, there's a lot of differing opinions about, I think, how he could have played that out on a micro level. But it was also a game where he 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 spent two games being, like, he was 14-0 in, in the second game, and he was 14-0 for almost the entirety of the third game as well uh, up until that very last team fight in that game. That match really was on a razor's edge. So, I mean, real big credit to D plus. I feel like they continue to get better. Lucid continues to get better. Um, he's drawing a lot of bands now. It's like teams are definitely respect vanning his li Vi and Lee Sin, which opens up a lot of picks for other players. They're willing to like test the fringes of the meta and play Showmaker on very good Showmaker champs, even if they're not the most meta champs at the time being. And they're stacking up their gold on aiming in a way that makes sense. So D plus is still a very good team. They're just, there's not quite there yet, unfortunately. And at least it's the obvious angle, Monty. The obvious angle is this, right? Being as lucid actually does look like he's tracking to be the truth. He's going to be a, a good player yes. who can be on like a contender, etc. The obvious move to me is this. You just keep the core and you figure it out. Probably Kingen. You just get like, replace Kingen with a better top player. Dude, you'd be right there. You'd be like, if you'd be you, like a team that could go to the finals. Like this isn't even a bad squad. If you replace Kellen with a shot caller too, I think you'd be doing something. Because remember, they tried as that. Another one. Remember, they tried the, to get Bible in there because they thought last year, because they thought this would be a better situation, right? You know, the shot calling on D+, plus, the voice continues. So, I mean, I think you have a choice. Like, is Lucid going to develop into that guy? Or do you get a support that can do that? Because um, I don't think, like, Kellen is not, by any means, the greatest individual player of the uh, in the uh, support player in the LCK, but he is an LCK caliber player, and he does have good games. 
uh, to pretend otherwise is ridiculous, but he's not really, you know, what this team needs. It's the same way that Delight leaving Gen G was a bummer in some ways, but because last year I would say probably Delight was a better player across the entire year than Lehens. Lehens was a fraudulent MVP. Oh, <laughs> you know, he was, yep. he was a he was a fraudulent MVP. Like both BDD and Keen were robbed in summer of like that MVP that should have been one of theirs. Um, but Lens is good. But what Lehens does is he provides the shot calling that left with Peanut. Like Chovy has developed into like a mutual shot caller with Lehens on this current iteration of, of Gen G. But if they had kept a light, I think Gen G would have been a worse team. Um, and I think if you get somebody even who's like maybe a little bit worse than Kellen, but actually has better macro sense and better shot calling, D plus actually could go somewhere. I mean, a, a crazy thing to say too, Thorne is honestly like perfect on KT right now. I would rather see him in this lineup than Kingen. Perfect is actually getting very good oh, also. Yeah. Like, if you're yeah. going to like go in on young talent, no, then why not do it? Like, no, here's, the here's sad an idea. Thing is, Tim what have you like, got? What have you this got? This year's more of a write off. It's more like for next year. But if you got, let's, let's say you don't want to break the bank and you're D plus, what happens if you get perfect and Pleta on this roster? I think it's better. I think it's a better team. Plut is like actually very good as a support player, and I think he's very much underrated. Uh, so but no, to me the thing is the way that LTK is right now. In theory, D plus can still challenge for the last world spot. But the difference is, I don't think they would do that much at Worlds. I just think that they actually have, considering remember, dude, in a world where Canyon leaves your team, you're never supposed to be able to recover from that. There's no like pivot that gets you back to the same spot, bro. They could really, if they make the right off season moves at the end of this year, have a better lineup than they had the last few years with Showmaker and Canyon. They could have a better one, not the one, the old prime one in 2021 yeah. and 2020, of course, but like the last few years, they were just like at best dark horse this actually looks like yeah. they could for real challenge to be like the third or second best lck team with the with the core they've got like it's not bad like you just start with those three players fucking lucid showmaker and aiming bro that, that's enough right there those are like known quantities they, uh, the elusive guy like you said could even get better you could just get better even obviously he could also degrade but right now i've seen uh, all the signs have looked good for me yeah, really. he even yeah, looked yeah. like he's he settled good. in the first split he's gotten good this split like he, he's i can see why they're promoting him mate. he is legit yeah, He's I mean, good. he he and Thanatos were like the most hyped up players coming out of the the Korean tier two scene. Um, you know, now there's like KT's challengers roster, which is you know people are hyping up like them as a unit, um, which might be interesting to kind of see them depending on what KT does and if KT wants to actually spend money next year. Because the weird thing about KT as an org guys is they like. We'll spend money and then the next year they won't spend money and then the next year they will spend money like they just like seesaw back and forth in terms of spending money it's very strange to watch it's like their budget gets cut one year but then it's like tripled the next year then it's like you know one quarter of what it was then it's eight times what it was like i don't understand really how they allocate money because they never kt never seems to have like a consistent amount of money year to year regardless of the performance that they have because like you would have thought wow, KT probably wants to keep that roster or something close to it because it's really yeah. quite good by the time they played last it's summer. Good. Yeah, of course. Um, and nah, we're just, we're just not going to do that. Just hold on to BDD. Everybody else <laughs> just gets eliminated from the team. No, the and we're gonna pick thing up for the me about that was... Like, I know what you mean. It seems like every two years, they just remember, like, shit, we're supposed to be KT. Why don't we spend this money and become a yes. contender again like T1? Yes. And then every time they do it, the, they don't they get, then like, do a what team. we just talked about with D+. <laughs> They don't ever do the pivot. Like, the obvious move to me was the idea... You, by the way, that's why I also say there should be a lower bracket of Worlds, Monty. We now have to just pretend KT sucked last year. Yeah, They were absolutely, like, on paper, the second-best Korean team for most of the fucking year. Like, yep. they were looking awesome until playoffs. They used to look dope in the regular splits, both of them. Then what happened was they fell off a bit in the playoffs, and then the problem at Worlds was they weren't even that bad. They just lost to JDG. Like, if you look they at also, that roster, they also again... Had the, they had the hardest the strength team. of schedule. They had the hardest Swiss strength of schedule as well, which was ridiculous. Yep. There's the thing. You wouldn't wipe that lineup. You would make, again, like one change. Like the obvious one to me would maybe get like someone. By the way, here's the obvious angle. Since you knew Peanut was leaving, maybe get Peanut instead of Cars or something. Like, bro, you could have you could have done a pivot on that lineup and still made it really good. You, you have like the carries in all the positions. What do you want? I mean, even if you're KT, I would rather see them like promote their tier two team and then just like wait and see who's good and then 
you know, iterate off of that. What they do is they, when they don't spend money, they sp still spend too much money, and then they get a bunch of washed motherfuckers like Piotr and Barrel. They do have a lot of washed players, don't they? <laughs> Yeah. So it's like it, it, what, what's annoying about KT is they're either like assembling a super team or it's just like washed city. And there's no there's never like, oh, we're going to develop this player as our star player. And then like they're going to be with us forever. They never do that, by the way. There was never like a fake or equivalent. They had score. That was it. And they did keep score for a long time. And score was the core of their team. But, it, you know, score had to go through years where he had fucking bums for teammates. And then he had then he had 2018 KT, which was like the God roster. Right. Um, and I, I just wish like we would actually see them develop a player that they actually build around over a long period of time because KT has just lacked an identity as a team. And that's my problem with them. Like BDD is. Sure, he's been there for the past couple of years, but he's been everywhere. I mean, BDD's on been on every fucking team, right? Um, he's not like the KT guy in the way that Score was, or the way that you know Showmaker is, right? Still on D plus. Um, it it just feels like very strange the way that KT operates because they don't actually commit to a rebuilding process or using the rookies that they're developing in their tier two scene and then kind of like weed out the bad ones and then replace them with like currently powerful players to like make a push they instead just like disassemble a perfectly good roster and then fill it with bums this year and we get this iteration of kt I know what you mean, though. Like, the obvious angle you would have done is if you'd have just promoted the overall team, you would just have them hard play around perfect and see if he really is, like, the god carry. And then next year, you just put in the appropriate pieces to have the good squad. Yeah. Whereas instead, what you do is, like, actually, this year's KT is very much what you're talking about. It's where you have, like, a bunch of players where the name value is there. But actually, I think half the problem you end up with immediately is when someone has the name value, but they're not actually that player anymore, you're going to be have a warped team set up, aren't you? You're going to have players where you're playing around them like they were the old MVP player of the league, but they're not anymore. They're just, like, an all right mid laner or fucking AD or something. So that's half the problem is that, like, is... I also think that's disjointed because if you're if you're perfect, Monty, you can't just come in and go, "Hey, BDD, you're deft. Sit down, man. I am here." Like, no, you're not. Even though you should be here to carry, you aren't here to carry, bro. That's BDD and deft. You don't know who they are. Like they are literally like the mainstays of the league for like ten years. <laughs> so yeah, you, you know, show luck at that point. I, 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 have a, I, have, I have another question for you, Thorin, which is like, so KT is basically just DRX, the world's winning roster of DRX, except with a better mid laner in BDD, and at this point, maybe a better top laner in Perfect. So if DRX was a totally That's legitimate right. world champion, why is this team so bad? <laughs> right? <laughs> You're, like, it's actually also just do appreciate a better it. version like, of DRX. <laughs> like, if you ever wanted to see that Koreans aren't, like, the perfect human sp specimens who just have leveled up and we're all behind them, Bro, even they buy into that garbage that DRX was good. Because how many fucking times have people signed two DRX players at the same? It's mental. These guys have had way too many gigs. Like, bro, we were just talking. How is King even still on those teams? Like, I don't get it, mate. It's like the Korea produces top playing talent out of its ass all the time, and this guy's just been on fucking some really good squads. Like, I don't know how though. I don't know how they well, just believe in that. Because the problem is, you know this. Like, one of the things that, in a way, I respect, but I also hate about Koreans is if you win, they will absolutely just give you all your credit. They'll just be like, well, you were better than me. And that means what you did was right and how you practiced was right and your team was better. Even though sometimes those might not be true. Like, obviously, sure. me and you live in denial. Like, JDG was better even though team won. But they, <laughs> Koreans don't do that. To a Korean, the second the win happens, whoever won does get to be the better team. And they did everything right. And they practiced harder. They believe it all. They, they have, like, very much, you can see how, like, there's a guiding ethos that makes them great at the game. But this is where the blind spot occurs. It's like, obviously, here's another example, Monty. Should I tell you another example that is infuriating if you think about it. How the fuck in summer last year, Monty, was every player on KT voted best in their role, but then that lineup doesn't even stay together? <laughs> Bro, the whole of Korea told you you have the best five-man lineup and you don't even re-sign that whole squad. What is this? It's just bollocks, isn't it? It's absolute bollocks, mate. That's, uh, you know it's not true. Everyone knows it's not true. 
Even those players knew it wasn't true. By the way, that in collect collectively, that is one of the most egregious fan voting ever. Lehen's MVP. He would be bottom of our list for MVP on that team. There's literally like three other people I'd pick ahead of him. And then the whole KT roster, including cars, like they're just all the best players in Korea. What are we talking about? What are we doing there? And then they get dumped by T1 with spot. Faker coming off an industry, uh, an injury uh, in on. the playoffs. No, outrageous. It's all right, man. Thorin, as as Wolf and I discussed, it's going to be even more egregious when Pays is somehow first team All Pro. Uh, this oh, this no. split instead of Viper. Oh, no. Yes, that's how it's oh, going to no, go. Okay. The worst thing is, I'll actually give credit to the LPL for this. LPL is actually pretty good at sometimes giving people the status even when their team isn't like the second best team or whatever. Bro, Viper's career is going to look so dirty if you look on League PD and you didn't watch the games. Like this guy, I can say, put it this way, unironically, and I don't care if you think I'm glazing him. If I had to pick, this guy right now, Monty, in all of League of Legends is like a candidate for player of the year. Think about for the whole year. This guy's just been unbelievable from day one to now, pretty much. He, he, he very rarely ever... He, I, was he ever the reason they even lost a match? Like a series? I don't think so. <laughs> no. I feel like he just always gives you the His carry potential so sometimes they let him down. He's mega, isn't he? <laughs> Like, no, look, I, 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 I have a take that I often connect elsewhere, which is me and Kira from my Discord. We have the same take, basically, which is I don't really believe that, like, rulers playing, like, way worse this split. I think it's so all in as are just way worse than they used to be, though she is actually pretty good, it turns out. Like, your gal isn't knight. That's the problem. And I did tell you the whole time Ruler and the guy, the knight were there, is half of what made Ruler unbeatable is he had one of the most insane team fighting mids also waiting off on the side also of the fight. So you could never just engage that. on him. And so I actually think that rule is still amazing. But the difference is when you give him comparable players to Viper, Viper looks better. I just got to say it. He actually looks like a better player. Looks more crack because the difference is I think Ruler is more like he 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 has like a very beautiful style because it's very efficient. Viper is just like unbelievable mechanical ability, mate. Like like for me, it's him and Jackie Lover the two that have just blown my mind the last few years in ADC. I think they are so fucking good when they're on. When they're on, they look unbeatable. Yeah. Like, I've always thought in League, the, the defining analytical principle is this. In theory, the best role should always be mid lane. But when you see the truly godlike ADCs and top laners, bro, they make their role look broken. They make it look like like when the Shy was at his absolute peak. You would think, like, Tops is the most strong role in the whole game. You, just, you can't beat him. It's like that when Viper goes off. There's, there's fights Viper's in where I'm like, bro, yeah, I don't even need perfect peel. Just give him some peel and he'll win this fight. He's just too good. <laughs> it's why I knew Zeri coming back would mean it was game over for everyone else. Like, mate, you you can't give someone like him that champion. He will fucking tear the game up. I can't wait to see Hanwha. By the way, there's one angle. Bear in mind, we banged them all year. Now they've sort of... Re now, if if this Hanwha goes to Worlds, I'll enjoy it, bro. This team could do something. Sure. This could, they could mess up a lot of fucking LPL teams, I think. I, I'm concerned about the meta shift always with Zeka. You know what I mean? Like that is a that is a very big concern as to whether they kind of turn back into a pumpkin or not. Uh, but the meta right now is great for them. Um, it's great for them. Like Ivern AD mids is fucking rad for for uh, for Zeka and for Peanut. So um, and obviously Viper, as we've just discussed, is wonderful in the on these kind of champions. So it I think I think. They are being boosted by the meta, so I want to hold off on that just a little bit until we get further evidence. But I do think that they're pretty convincingly the second best team in Korea, right? I mean, what else do they have to do to prove it? They it was very close against T plus. They smashed T one. They they won the close series against T one that they might have, they probably should have lost in the first one, but then they smashed them in the second, you know, a week later in the second matchup. So who else is really out there right now? Like LCK is a pretty top heavy league, so. Um, we probably should check in on the LPL because uh, we're actually just yeah. as of today way, done. On the, on the last thing on the last thing on Hanwell Life as well is, bro. That's how you know this is like a charmed fucking split if you're Hanwell because even the fucking Lucian mid pick turns out to be like fucking dope on Zika. Like he doesn't have that many champions, guys. Like yes, he looked good on that. Like he looks like yep. could be a, as long as he stays on this patch. Like he's wheelhouse. gonna do some work. Yeah, definitely fits yeah. in his wheelhouse. And if uh, God, God. God help his opponents if Akali and Silas come back also because he, you know, yep. he his ceiling on some of these champions is crazy. It's just that his versatility is very low. 
Um, oh no, that is the craziest thing because half the time we just have to downplay the fact that he's not the the player he was when he won World Cup. Oh, here's the thing though: if World somehow was a patch that had like the sort of bullshit like melee slash assassin champions, he like the player, dude, they could actually they would be a dark horse to win the tournament for real, like for <laughs> <Yeah>. reals. <laughs> well, yeah, well this team, I think they could. Peanut performing internationally is always like the concern, right? He doesn't. Peanut Listen, doesn't travel eventually, well. <laughs> eventually, he's going to trip over and win one of these matches. Man. I, just, I, 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 I can't give up on you, Peanut. I'm like, I'm on my broke back match. I can't stop loving you, Peanut. I can't. I never I will. Mean, I love Peanut. I never will. I love it's, Peanut. At least because the other thing I also love as well, Monty, is I also really love that narrative journey where a player goes like Jankos from being the mechanical lease in player to being the brain jungler who's just the smartest yeah. guy and you can never catch him out on the map and they can play from me. I actually really love that archetype I of junglers. I, I think it's really beautiful to watch when you can do it. Peanut is legit one of my favorite players to watch so i mean i just know he's burned me too many times like for every fucking insane pathing run and like poppy flashing a drake bit so we can hex flash under your turret gank that we see i also watch him just walk into the enemy jungle yeah, at worlds and dies, <laughs> dies. So, uh... here's the problem on team as someone who has taken these really really dangerous fringe case gambles like back when people said simple was too toxic to ever be the best player or device used to choke the problem is this monty the worst than that counter narrative gets like they do choke every time they do fuck up when you expect to win even when they're the favorite they find a way to lose the problem is it makes it even more of a thrill though if you double down on the bet and it ever comes through Monty. <laughs> so your problem is this sir is if you decide finally you know what peanut I can't keep doing this to me or you. I've got to let you go. I've got to cut you loose. If he then goes on and wins worlds, you would be so fucking salty if you like pulled against him, bro. Because he'd be like, no, no, wait, I was I was the original one. No, I was on the train. They're like, well, I thought you cut ties, but you didn't you let him go? Like, no, no. Like, so in some ways, you have to just you have to go. It's like Katie Ross, you have to go down with the shit, Monty. You've got to just go down with this one. You've got to just I'm, I'm done going down all, with KT this year. Peanut and Chovy forever. No, no, no. I'm all in on Chovy Knight, Peanut. Fuck it, you know what? I'm still all in on Froggen. He doesn't even play League of Legends anymore. But if he came back, I believe he'd still be better than this key and be the MVP of the league. So never stop believing, mate. Never stop believing. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about LPL briefly. We can touch on it more next week because, like, this is when the playoffs are actually going to be starting, guys, sure. uh, is on Saturday. So if you're unfamiliar with the LPL playoffs, what's going to happen is we have to play, like, the play-in matches first between the two groups. Um, and that's what's going to be coming up uh, starting this week. Uh, it says they've been scheduled for the 3rd of August to start, uh, but we don't know the exact which matches are happening on which days. The first matches are going to be LGD versus IG, NIP versus uh, Rare Adam, and OMG versus Thunder Talk. So those are the top. Well, two of those are... So the the way the way it will work is that um, two of those teams are the bottom teams, LGD and NIP from the Ascend group, and then four of those teams are the top teams uh, from the bottom group. Um, so basically, two of the bottom group teams will play against each other. <laughs> I know. It's if you want to know how what a clown show League of Legends is, guys. NIP is so bad this split. There's a possibility they could lose that match. And are you ready? <laughs> Vickler, you're going to go, I don't know that name or what. Vickler could make it to the playoffs of the LPL over Rookie. That could <laughs> that could actually happen. Because Rare Atom is trash, but so is NIP <laughs> right now. Man. That is not even an impossible game. The, the Vickler you all saw run it down perma in NA could actually qualify over Rookie to the playoffs. So that could happen. That, that's the world we live in now, mate. By the way, as a quick note, I know we touched on it last week, but I want to reiterate it again. Since we're banging on formats, bro, whoever did figure out this LPL format, top that's marks, good. it's fucking dope. Like, uh, this actual group of just watching the Ascend group has been fucking amazing, mate. Like, uh, like no joke, every time I pull up Gamepedia, I'm used to my brain doing that thing where you quickly pass all the shit. Yep. There's, there aren't any. Almost <laughs> all of them are really interesting. Like, there, there are every day of the LPL now has been bangers, mate. Like, really high at level marquee matchups. It's awesome. I love it. Yeah. And it really went down to the wire, too, because um, BLG had to win against FPX to close out today. Now, I haven't yep. seen these games, uh, by the way, guys, because, again, these these were happening, like, lit literally while we were doing this show. It was just before we banned the, game, the match yeah. on it. Uh, so FPX versus BLG um, and BLG 
was did but actually pull off that win to take it, number one. I did see there was a game that they had where Knight got 21 kills <laughs> in that series we didn't watch today. <laughs> he's go. back and if I mean, you don't no, know no, he's nice been struggling. split off way 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 lower yeah exactly but they've sort of like what BLG's done is sort of like play themselves into some semblance of form like you know it's they're mad messy they lose games all over the place but they do still come through they do win they by also, the way the bot lane's got way better Elk looks way better like the, Bin was already really good anyway like this also they changed out the jungle which I'm guessing you were going to yes. mention right Jun by the way that move helped actually weighs better yes, believe it or not so far for playing the better. It is crazy because Jun in spring did look like the best jungler in the world. So, looked so really Jun, good, so. Jun looked good in spring, but also you would have thought like, ooh, like AP jungler diddly better. This is Jun's time Gosh. to shine. So it was, it yeah. was actually like really quite weird uh, that he was doing yep. so badly. So I wonder if there were some other issues. But BLG, you know, they've they've struggled when they couldn't like hard play through bot lane and like have that style that they started the year with. Um, and when they weren't winning in bot, like the, the map kind of fell apart. Also, Knight started this split like playing super badly there were there were players like scout and knight that like looked really ropey the difference is blg still won a bunch of games despite the fact that knight was bad <laughs> a lot of the time um but and like you say thorn they do drop a lot of games but i mean if you if like earlier this week they played anyone's legend right and yes they dropped game two but they came back and they like just shit on them in game three so oftentimes you know you see that mental composure where it's like ah oh, we lost this game but when when it comes time to like put the hammer down, they definitely do put the hammer down. Like a lot of their wins end up being pretty convincing, not in terms of like map score within a game, but just for the eye test when like push comes to shove and they need to win, they just destroy people. Um, ben has looked really good. Uh, this is still an extremely good team. The, the big surprise obviously is LNG's like bounce back. Um, because you would not have thought, given like rookie's form for a lot of this year, where it looked like he was like quiet quitting, Scout. that this that this would be the team. Like, but he's looked great. Like, re, or Scout. You sorry, mean yes. Scout? Scout? Yes, yeah, Scout yeah, has people. looked extremely good recently. Yep. Uh, also, I think it helps that Gala's always been a good Ziggs player. Like, people will be like, "Ooh, yeah, Gala Kaisa," but um, he's been a very flexible and like not necessarily married to eighty carries bot laner and in this meta having a, a good zigs bot lane particularly in the way the lpl drafts has been very valuable to this team so zika also in the top side has been doing really well it feels like there's been a glow up of players that kind of previously maybe hadn't shown that they were good on other teams so i've been it's been fun because lng was my favorite team from last year with the tarzan scout iteration uh in lpl and it feels good to see them kind of like pushing back and like really surprising, honestly, that they ended seven and one in this group. No, I actually think that of, even though we've talked about other leagues, like LEC, everyone looks shit. LCS is like a couple of teams. Is anyone even good? LCK is like a couple of teams at the top, a few in the middle. Bro, the parity towards the top of the LPL now is incredible. Think about the teams you've got. You've got BLG and LNG, like you say, have those runs. Meanwhile, you've still got fucking top esports is really good. JDG is actually not... Look, they've had some bad games, but they've got like the pieces to be good, obviously. Like, mate, the actual... like This, L this is going to be one of the coolest fucking playoff runs into Worlds qualification in a while actually like it looks like you could have some massive like variance in the results like I can, this bracket's going to play out very interestingly yeah and, and it's also far from an example you know think about those past things because you always had the night teams the last year and a half where it was just obvious they would win the league dude there's no obvious winner now like you can actually have an amazing round table now of like place your bets who wins the lpl like i could see someone going top esports and someone else goes blg that you know what i mean like there's a bunch of angles you could go I, with i mean what's wild is weibo in the in the qualification stage looked terrible you know and yep. Weibo was supposed to be the team that we were all excited about because oh look at this like they get Tarzan you know Tarzan takes a split off and then there are a lot of teams you know allegedly D plus actually like gunning for Tarzan as well and you look at this roster on paper of breathe Tarzan Zhao who lighted crisp and you get really excited based on the history of these these players crisp hasn't been so hot but recently isn't this also just a great fucking meta to bring Tarzan back, though? You couldn't know it, but, like, it's all the champions you want to see him play, bro. Oh, it's also like, brand. It's He's very really good, good. brand. <laughs> yeah, it's actually fucking amazing. Like, it's low-key, like, the perfect, like, what the doctor ordered to get this guy back. Because you know this, like, the sad thing about that player is he is one of the worst ones to be maligned by all of the international runs. Like, that guy domestically has been really good. If I, in fact, I don't care. Back when he was on Griffin back in the day, I thought he was the best jungler in the world. I thought he was unbelievably good. So, he can be so, so good at league, but he clearly 
somewhere he is, somewhere where it does matter what the patch is, who his teammates are, what the shot calling is. So I know the globe's been real. Like, here's the thing. We're boys in the Cap Garages, they're not going to win the fucking league or chance for the title. But the difference is, like, they can do something in playoffs now. Like, they can, they can take games and beat people. Because obviously on paper, the roster always looked way better than it, the results were in fucking spring. Yeah. So, it, yeah, they, like, they should have been doing better than they were. And now, so the top four teams in the standings are BLG, LNG, Top, and Weibo. So BLG and LNG will get, like, the deepest in the bracket. So they haven't really changed the uh, LPL playoff bracket, guys. It still is, like, you know, the top two teams get the most amount of buys. Um, and you you don't actually start the the double elim portion until you hit the uh, hit the top four. Um so it is just like the the single gauntlets uh, that are that are going down there. And I mean, it's going to be tough, too, because the way the gauntlet stands right now is on the bottom side of the bracket. It's FPX, then AL, then top esports, then LNG, which is like a hell of a run, actually, especially with how well anyone's legend and top esports have been doing this split. And the top side is, you know, two blank spots because it's going to be two of the qualification teams into JDG, into Weibo, and then into BLG. So it's going to be, it's going to be mega. Like a lot of these best of fives are going to be super good. I mean, LPL playoffs are very exciting and the format's very fun. Um, really does reward that regular season performance. And it's nice to have that reward, especially when it was so difficult this time because of the split between the two groups to get top two, right? It feels like LNG and BLG really had to fucking earn those buys. Oh, for sure. I, there's another thing the format showed is because it wasn't just like the normal LPL where it's like, oh, I got like, I, I won four out of my last five games. And then you look, it's like you beat Wear Out and Thunder Talk, you, you Ultra Pat, <laughs> you know, the ones that you'll cover. Because of this group format, they have to be legit. I mean, even when I'm hit on Weibo, they did win more games than I expected. They just didn't beat the elite teams. I don't think they can actually win the championship. But no, I agree. Like this, if anything, this group stage format also, because it's a murderer's roar, you have to actually be really good. Like LNG did have to fucking glow up like a motherfucker to win all these games. But LG had it hard fought to get back to the top. Like every single game, people are challenging you. Think about this. Also, notice how different that environment must be for a top LPL team. Bro, if you're BLG and suddenly there's blood in the water, every week that team who's playing you thinks they can beat you. It's not like the old LPL where you're going to get those two games where you dunk on some shitters and style on them and then you have like even by the way not even just the games just the breathing room of having two weeks where you play one good opponent in this one you're playing a good opponent every few days and you have to get your shit together otherwise all of a sudden you will absolutely be at like the bottom half of that fucking table so I think this format is absolutely it's just it's proven itself mate it looks mega I hope they do it again for all the years coming forwards <laughs> yeah and top esports too if you guys are thinking oh well they're not as high they had to play both BLG and LNG they lost both of those matches Matches, but it was in the they first the week. Strength of schedule to start with. Yeah, 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 they had the worst strength of schedule, and it was in the week they were coming back from the esports World Cup, um, uh, where they made the finals. Like they had that very deep run, and sure, like they outperformed BLG at that tournament, and then came back and immediately lost to them. And BLG was in the same position when it came to travel, but they didn't make the same deep run. They didn't play as many games, um, and like top esports. After those first two losses in that initial week, they came back has won every single match they played since, and they haven't dropped a game. So like the yep. heat check on top esports is actually crazy as well. So sure, did they lose to the top two teams in the league? Yes. Are there extenuating circumstances? Yes. Have they looked much better since that first week of competition? Also, yes. Right. Um, and they've pretty much just dispatched everyone else. That also with makes ease. sense, though, because I do think their roster is really good. The top esports one, I think. Oh, it, yeah. Look, it has certain obvious flaws, but the, the difference is, you know what? Here's the funny thing: when you have a flaw like Peanut internationally or Will Tiancho, I actually sort of take those flaws though, because it comes with a big upside. Like, you know what the upside to those players are, and they can be really good. I prefer that than the players that are just like an actual seven out of ten. Like, who gives a shit about? That? It's like when we talk about BDS earlier, right, Monty? As fucked oh, yeah. up as it sounds, in a way, you would rather have the Fnatic roster and hope that Humanoid smurfs than the new one and go, show yes. the 7.5 out of 10 performance gets, you know, you can, <laughs> who can get in on that, you know, you can, who can? <laughs> well, it's just a matter of relative to the competition, right? Like, you need something to elevate you in the LEC to beat G2. And if you don't have that X factor that can reach the next level, yes. which like BDS just doesn't have, you just can't win. Because when the veterans turn on, like, that's, that's what separates you. So, I mean, top esports, I mean, I think you could make a very compelling argument that Mako is the greatest support player to ever play the game of League of Legends at this point in time with this guy's longevity and the, the rosters that he's been on. It's, I mean, his legacy is fucking crazy, right? 
He's definitely no, he in that conversation. Guy, yeah. Um, so I, I mean, top top is really stacked, and yeah, it's fun to laugh at Tian because Tian is a rightful Dade Award winner, a hundred percent. He was also a world's MVP. Like the floor is low, the ceiling is high. <laughs> he's, just, he's just not consistent. Um, but when he's on, he's, weird. he's the great. obvious thing. The obvious thing I'll just throw out there. If it wasn't a big deal that we came up with the Dade Award, why not just rename it and have your own award, guys? Or is it because the Dade Award's the most perfect name ever and we sort of culturally <laughs> took that space up within the air? Yeah, I guess we win then, so we invented it. Shut the fuck up, which is it? Either we did or we didn't. But I think we take do some viewer questions now, yeah? All right. Well, uh, we will take a quick break, guys, and we'll be back with some viewer questions. Probably going to be a shorter segment this week because we're already, what, over three hours into this one, but we will do a few. We'll see you in a couple. It's going to be the final segment of the show, which is obviously our viewer question segment. Just like when we do the sponsors, we often point out that you engaging with the products you think are good and getting those savings and free months, et cetera, on the different things helps us out. Also, another way you can help us out and help yourself out, because we always like to, we're, we're actually true American classical liberals in that sense. We like to appeal to the selfishness of you, but in doing so, your selfishness can help build a greater global harmony. So what we're going to do is, if you support us by subscribing to our Discord, the Last Foundation Discord, you can then ask questions in our questions channel for this show, and then we pick the good ones. Obviously, it's a little bit more limited the amount of time we have this time, but some of them, if they can roll over, can be rolled over too. We'll, we'll answer some ones in future ones. So Monty will select some of the questions from our yep. Discord. Yeah, sorry guys, it's going to be a little bit shorter this week because we're already th over three hours into this show, so I need to sleep at some point. Uh, in the case of players like Jensen that are still playing good enough to be a pro, is he? Uh, but still at a worse level relative to the competition. Is that is it that other players slash competition improves over the years and their level remains the, uh, someone somewhat the same, or is it more a decline in their skill? So basically, other players... I actually players... think this framing is so weird, though, because here's the weirdest thing about this framing. I know why he's asking, because I actually think almost everyone else in esports does frame it the way he just said there. Like, no one ever says Faker got worse. They say people caught up to Faker. Right. I think that's actually an absurd premise, Monty, because the mistake they're making is this. I'll explain it very simply by using a dominant team. Think about Gen G, right? So the logic would go, when you set the Gen G roster... Were they the absolute best in the world on day one? No, they weren't. Like, you could see the first game, remember, against T1. Like, they sort of won, but it was a bit sketchy. Over the split, they powered up. Then when they finally won the split, they looked really good. Then they looked, some we could even argue, even better at MSI, right? Here's the point to make. They didn't just set the lineup and then do the bare minimum practice from week one and just stay at that permit level, like, statically. Their level was going up and down as they practiced, worked on the meta. Players played themselves in a form. Opponents were there. So I think the mistake everyone makes in esports is they act in esports, Monty, like, Every player and team is a character. Is a character in like, uh, like uh, the example yeah. would be like Top Trump's game. You know, one of the ones where you have a set marker, you're nine out or Dungeons right. or, and Dragons. Or you have an, an intelligence RPG, score. Like you level up and you can't go down, right? Yes. But the point is, they act like you get to that level and then you don't have to do anything. You're just there. That's who you are every time. So yep. the mistake they make is you're always fluctuating. You're always battling to get that form. It's actually why when people who are the absolute best can have that form multiple times in one year, it is incredible. It's like amazing because you know everyone's got in for them. Everyone's studying what they're doing. Everyone's cynically drafting against them and figuring out game plans and traps to set them up. And then, then they can still be the absolute best. That's how you know they're the best of all time. So basically, the reason why I find this a bit of a weird question is, am I... I'm, I don't want to pretend like I'm an alien by having an eye to look at the game. But bro, did you not watch Jensen when he used to play on like Prime Cloud Nine or his first year on Team Liquid? He was about ten times better than this. Like it wasn't that he was doing the same moves and everyone else. Like, like right. think about it logically. So George Opion, who didn't even play a league back then, caught up on him, even though he should be like seven years behind permanently. No, Jensen got worse, and George o, relative to the current competition is better. Like I don't even think this is that complicated a question. I don't really get the point. Like why I would mean, why would you level steer? I mean, it's league for fuck's sake. You don't even play the same champions. It's, it's, it's definitely well he's. Said, or is it a decline in their skill? And I think it, in Jensen's case, it's just like the motherfucker, like I, I can just tell you, he wasn't really playing league in that fucking split he had off, guys. He was never like, a grinder. He was never yeah, a grinder. He's not a grinder. So, and like he basically hasn't recovered the form across, a, you know, a large champion pool. He's got a couple of picks, but like, I mean, 
him going back to the like dipping back into the zillion well was fucking sad. <laughs> I mean, what really? What the fuck also, was that? I've heard it implied he also has a bit of frog in him as well, where he doesn't want to like play the newer style of mid. He just wants to play his style and win the lead sure. and always have open CS and have the jungle attention of the gangs. Like, so I, I do think he's also maybe a little bit selfish in his older age. Or maybe you could get away with that when you were the absolute best players, the sure. obvious example, you know? Who are the best talent scouts, meaning people who scout players in esports? I mean, I always said, like, the the original MVP roster, like, the, the management of MVP, the organization, because remember, MVP, the Korean team, actually scouted out all of those players and, like, stuck by them. So players that became very famous and went to China as part of the Samsung blue and white rosters were kind of like homegrown by MVP. They had Deft in the very early days of his career in 2013 when he was getting fucking, you know, when MVP blue was getting shit on by Faker, that team had three members that would become Samsung blue that would dominate in the very next year. Even across other esports, like think about MVP StarCraft team, MVP's fucking Heroes of the Storm game, MVP Black, that team that had one of the greatest, uh, you know, win streaks, like 87 matches, I think, or something like that in esports history. You don't think like, of the NIP one, but it was a good one. It was no, good. no, it was the, the MVP hey, Black one. It was NIP. Okay, well, what, what was the MVP Black one? Uh, I'm guess theirs is 40 or something, if I had to guess. Let's have a look. Look what the streak is. MVP Black streak. 35. I'll guess 40. Something. There you go. It's he's too much, mate. But it's 37. Oh, 37. It was 37, uh, I think, by when the I end. Google it, says that, yeah. Um, so it, it was a very long win streak. They dominated Heroes of the Storm. Like, this was a team that actually was probably the most insane group of, like, like the management and the upper-level people had such an insane eye in, like, you know, 2012 through 2015, 2016. Like, MVP developed a ridiculous amount of talent. Um, so for me, I don't know what you think, but for me, they, they've they been, like, the best talent scouts in the history of esports. Oh, oh apparently I Googled it. That was just the Google set. Apparently it was 41 game streak they claimed. For ah, the MVP very point. good. The MVP's up there. I mean, obvious ones in leagues. This is a league show. Would be, the obvious one to me, CV Max from Korea. Sure. Not only did he scout all those godlike Korean players, Viper, Tarzan, ch fucking Chovy, but bro, just throw this in there. He also found fucking Kanavi. Like, this guy is unbelievable. Then, what, he got Carrier into DRX. Like, but this guy's eye is actually unreal. Then if you want to go all the names, I would probably say Aaron from China. If you think of some of the people yep. he brought into, like fucking, what, Coral Water or something. He would pay yeah. Peter's... Yeah, there would just be people you didn't even know, and suddenly they'd be like world class, like playing with the best teams in the world. So, no, I think there's a few obvious ones. I'm trying to think of good Western ones. I mean, people would say Peter Don, maybe. He's just had a pretty good track record of bringing people through. Uh, who else? Who else would be good in the West? I'm trying to think, is there anyone who's really good in NA? Talent scout. Not that I can I think of off the top one. of my head. I think Reaper himself is usually pretty good. Sure. He's got a pretty good eye in general, though, I'd say. He's got a pretty good player for performance evaluation. Putting financial considerations aside, i.e. thinking strictly in terms of in-game performance, what would be the optimal time for T1 to let go of Faker? Any active player that would be an upgrade over him on T1? The problem with replacing Faker is replacing his shot calling. Like, even if you would, like, it, it would, if you're purely considering his mid lane performance, now is the time, right? Like, yesterday is the time. Like, it was the question, is Scout a better player than Faker? The answer is yes. Um... You know, he is Chovy better? Yes. Who can actually shot call and understand the macro side of the game as well as Faker and puppet the those other four players? The problem with replacing Faker is I think you have to replace other people on that T1 roster to make it functional, right? Like, I think if you bring in Chovy, you like, sure, he's he's part of that shot calling role, but at that point, do you also have to bring in Lehens as the other part of the shot caller force, right? So I think it's hard. But I do think purely on individual form, you could have replaced Faker already, and T1 likely would have been a better team if his shot calling wasn't also, I think, critical to that team's success. What makes all Faker conversations boring as fuck if they're about how he played the last few years is people refuse to look at what you're talking about or watch regular season games, and they just look when he has a glow up at Worlds and say that's who he was the whole time. So what they do is they still pretend that it's not about shot calling or being a captain or facilitative mid-Monty. They still pretend Faker is like an actual top five 
player in League, not even midlaner, not even midlaner, player in League of Legends, which right. is absurd. Because what you've just said to me isn't shocking at all. Anyone who watched both Fake It in all the regular season LCK games and last year's Scout, Scout is clearly the better midlaner. If you yeah. drop both of them in a desert and tell them go into the jungle and pick four players and come back and play a game with them, right? Essentially, the midlaner that would be better is easily Scout. That's not even like much of a debate for me. Now, if you go, you can have pick of actual real pro players and we're going to listen to you. Maybe Fake is a better cap. Captain, maybe if he so my problem with that one is people are already Monty gonna look at worlds and go, We don't need it, Monty. Look, LNG versus T1 in quarterfinals. Haha, <laughs> look, Scout is not as good. Like, miss me with that shit. Miss me with all that. Tarzan shit. So also I think into actually, that series. <laughs> and it's just the most obvious narrative ever to bring Scout back because he was from T1. It's the most per I actually think the narrative is obvious what you do, Monty. You move Faker to coach and you bring Scout yes. in to work under Faker at the minute. Yes. That is the dream. Like that narratively, it's perfect. By the way, it's even dope if you're a T1 fan, because what you sell them on is he's already won worlds with EDG. Like you want another ch let's get another fucking cop in yes. the another banner at the rafters, as it were. I think it's actually an easy sell, even if you do it I right, agree. you know. And also, Scout has low-key been trying to come back to Korea for many years now. He just got caught in yeah. contract hell. He was already... Guys, he yeah. literally signed a contract with KT that was voided because of a contract he had in Jenna. He was trying to get onto KT very hard a couple of years ago. Um, Are there any potential players you think could have been potentially better if they didn't win so early in their careers? Examples like... So oh, players, uh, like Including Nuggery and the Shy. <clears throat> the question is like... Would they have been better? Would they have continued to be as good? Or like, were these players that were just like super good early in their careers and were like a flash in the pan or like they were uniquely motivated in, you know, when they were young and maybe worlds like made them demotivated or something like that when they could have kept on grinding? I don't know. I, I mean, to me, I, I wouldn't even have to go with the world's one. I think an obvious example is humanoid. Bro, he sure. won in like his third year or something like I think actually it, it was a detriment to his career that he won the championship, Monty. If I think if he'd have always still been just on a contender, but he, like last he had to battle for years and years, I think it would have made him level his game up a bit more. I think, like I say, I think once he won those championships, and remember, he won in an era when the, there was that reckless super team that everyone said was automatically going to walk Europe and win everything. If you win like that, of course you're going to get a big ego. You're going to think, bro, I was behind every game and I just fucking smurfed on it all and shit on everyone. And, I, and I'm in a region where Caps is and I'm winning the championship. Bro, maybe I I am the shit. I actually think that was harmful to his career. I really do. I actually think similar things, by the way, about Reckless. I think actually it was terrible for Reckless that he got to join a team of already established veterans and the best players and then win a couple of chips early on when it wasn't really him at his peak. And I've told people, I think actually it held him back for years and years and years. I think it made him play a one-dimensional style of league for like five years. And then for me, it was actually only the bad fanatic, that season six one, when he had to hard carry, that sort of like awoken some of like the fucking potential Potential within him, and I thought he could have his career could have taken a very different route. It's just then he got caps, then he got swords, and we put, and then he got another super team. So I actually think it's a very valid, it's a very valid point. Pretty swear, Monty. I think this can work two different ways. It can either work with the guy who wins too soon, too early, or sometimes it can go the other way. Like I actually do think, by the way, that people like Froggen and Jensen in mid lane and forgiven and upset as ADC. So some of my favourites, I think, on some level, Monty, they are actually ruined sometimes by not winning early on because eventually you see their playing style almost has built into it. I will never trust certain teammates and the game always has to be on my back as it were. Like, I think you have seen that where people like upset. They won't let themselves be carried. I mean, true, some of these lamps couldn't carry them, but that then creates an environment where even when they get in the top team, they're still a bit too selfish sometimes, you know, so I think it's a valid, it's an interesting sort of like philosophical discussion. Is Genji already the best team ever? No. <laughs> To me, this team is better than 2023 JDG and 2015 SKT. Dude, 2015 SKT being in this conversation is so fucking fraudulent, guys. They played in a domestic circuit. First off, they didn't win MSI, and they played in a domestic circuit where literally all 10 players on the two best teams that had spent all of 2014 just fucking 360 windmill dunking on T1. And sure, you know, T1 had a different roster, like... Piglet was like a lot of the players on that roster in 2014 were like really washed. 
you know, after the 2013, 2014 winter split. Here's a bonus hit, Monty. Bear in mind, it wasn't just the Samsung teams. Remember, it was like Flame and Save and fucking Kakao and Roki. Yeah. Bro, essentially, if you make a list in 2014 of the top 20 Korean players, it's like about 16 of them went to the fucking LPL. Yes. So, like, <laughs> you're picking the team that then won against what the other six players, the other four players in this scenario. Like, I, I know what you mean. The field just can't have been as good by definition. Can't I mean, and, and, like, it was kind of a miracle that that was also the year that the Tigers came up because like that didn't have to yep. happen either. Like it, no, the fact exactly that imagine. Yeah. The, if, if that team hadn't like magically existed, it would have even been more of a walkover for T1. Um, they also didn't win MSI that year. Um, so I don't even think they're really in consideration for the best team. Here's the line for you. Are you ready? If everyone wants Faker to be the goat mate, well, that year he was playing against Kuro, young Kuro, <laughs> and fucking Nagne. Yeah. I mean, if people don't know, this isn't even a joke. The actual best of the middle, and it wasn't even them. It was that guy Coco on CG Enters yes. before. He sort of fell off after that year. Like, th that was yeah, like one of the weakest pool pools was, ever in Korea, yeah, guys. It was really bad. Rookie and rookie left, Dade left. You know, Pawn left. Like Pawn also beat Faker at that MSI. So I don't know, man. Like I, uh, th Thorne, there's some really weird mythologizing around 2015 SKT that I oh. don't really understand. It ignores a lot of the context of the the massive Korean exodus, and also ignores. I think it's very cause what they do, Monty, is they just look and they go, they were one game from doing the Grand Slam. That's what they just do. That angle, I think, is why they. They also them. had a very dominant them. world's run, but like that isn't the story sure. of their whole year, and it certainly isn't the story of that roster of SKT being like super mega good. By the um, way, here's a better question, Monty. Despite what he says, the first thought I had when he listed those names was, I'd love to find out. I tell you what, I would love to see JDG from last year play this year's Gen G. Wouldn't that be a fucking sure. amazing match, bro? I, that okay, would be I the can't... ultimate. In some ways, in some ways, isn't that the ir immovable object against the irresistible force? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's like the fucking team that can't be beaten when they're behind it's... against the team that just runs everyone over. Like it'd be amazing that game. It's. <laughs> It's really annoying also that JDG didn't wasn't able to run back that roster because T1 did. And like we could have seen that yep. the rematch between those exact yeah, same too. 10 players. It's very yes. annoying that we don't have that JDG roster this year. It's really, really annoying. Um, but they look. If Gen G continues to do well, if they win summer, if they do well or win at Worlds, they are, they're already in the conversation. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. They're already in the conversation. Yeah. Put it this way. If I had to guess off the top of my head, they'd probably be like fourth best team or something at all time. But they're not number one. They're not number one yet for me. I, in fact, I'd even say the reason why they're not number one for me, Monty, is it's why I actually do think the more important argument is it can Chofi be the best player ever? Because I think what he does on this team is also really superlative. Like, I think actually it isn't the most obvious slam dunk best team ever. And by the way, nobody had that take when this team formed. They're like, this is going to win yeah. everything. It can't be beaten. Like, yep. Actually, everyone was like, how will it work? It's a super team. I think actually yes. the way Chofi's played, he deserves most of the credit on this well, one. Well, the question really about this iteration of Genji coming into this year is who the fuck is shot calling on this roster because peanut was like hard leading the last team and you know there wasn't a guarantee that chovy was going to step up into an end game leadership role like that's not a thing that happens with every player and there wasn't really a clear person to do that because canyon wasn't that guy like i mean d plus macro was fucking terrible last year when canyon was on that team like he wasn't that guy so it's basically like can lehens and chovy do this and the answer apparently is yes which is great but it's not it was far from a sure thing it was far from a sure thing plus pays is still a relatively young player and you never know how that's going to go either um also by the way even though this itself isn't actually an argument against t1 2015 i'll just say this monty Part of me also does think I'm so glad that I don't have to have the opinion that the best lineup ever to play League of Legends featured Bengi, Wolf, and Bang. So I'm just going to put that out there. You know what? It's a lot easier for me to look at that roster of JDG or Gen G and go, <laughs> I'm happy with these players. <laughs> fuck the idea that three-fifths of that team was a bunch of bombs. I don't even care about I don't, I don't give a fuck. They're not the best. They never will be. <laughs> Listen, they got the championships. I can't stop that, but they don't get to be the best ever. No. I, so I actually really like this next question. I don't know if you saw this, Thorne. Did you see the Nike ad, Winning Isn't For Everyone, voiced by Willem Dafoe? Have you seen this ad? I think you'd really like it. I think so. It came out right before the Olympics. Um, if so, what do you think of it and the backlash it got for promoting narcissism in esports? So it's it's Winning Isn't For Everyone, and it's a, it's basically Willem Dafoe like, talking about how, you know, 
the drive. Oh, don't I'll listen to it while you talk. Go for it. Yeah. 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 It, the, the, the drive is basically, if you guys haven't listened to it, it's basically like the, the drive to victory and the sacrifices it takes and the pursuit of excellence isn't for everybody out there. So it's a very, like, I would say super accurate take on the nature of competition, but people don't want to hear that these days, guys, because this is the culture that complains about, oh my God, I can't believe that those pro players or those athletes have to work for 16 hours a day to be the best of things because people are stuck in the mindset of like, well, there's my nine to five, better go home and crack open a beer. Anything else is detrimental to my mental health. And it's like, you are not built the same as these people who are uniquely obsessed with this one thing. And like, it just takes that much effort to be the best at something, right? It, it's just very weird that 10 years ago, we would have all been celebrating Kobe Bryant's mentality and dedication to his craft and understanding of his excellence. Now we're like, but why didn't Kobe take a break sometimes? It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, basically, when we watch these people's excellence, we are in appreciation and awe of their dedication to this thing where they have such a uniquely singular mindset to do this one thing that it is incredible. And like, why can't we just approve? That's one of the most powerful aspects of humanity. So anyway, I really like this ad. I thought it was great, but I also understand why people are whining about it. It's like, I want to be a winner too, even though I am going to put in 20% of the hours of this other person. No, winning isn't for everybody. That's just it. I, I love that message, honestly. It felt real. No, I just watched it now. I actually think you've nailed it. The real problem is this. It goes completely... Essentially, the problem is this. Even though there is no culture ever that fucking glazes the winner more than American culture, because <laughs> it's actually inherently what Americans think yes. of themselves as. Like, yes. we're supposed to be the best. We're always the best in the world. And if we aren't, there's something wrong. They simultaneously demand the expectation, like LCS, that you should win everything. But then they literally have now... And this is a sign of cultural decline, guys. Have now prioritized prioritize things in culture for exactly these jobs that are inappropriate that would make it so you could never be Kobe Bryant you could never be Michael Jordan you could never be Tiger Woods you could never be Michael Phelps because what would happen you'd have someone come in and take the mindset that's actually applicable to how like a school teacher would talk to a five year old child and we talk to a pro athlete like come on now you need to take a break this isn't good for your mental health you do understand the genius of some of these people is they're actually like it's funny that sports like basketball in theory, aren't like being a gladiator. You don't die at the end of it, money. You just play basketball. Sure. But in some ways, what you what you actually give up is instead of giving up your physical life by dying as gladiator for entertainment, Kobe Bryant probably did give up his mental health, mate. He probably did yep. give up certain things oh, about absolutely. his body. He sacrificed his family for time. our entertainment so we could see <laughs> the zenith of where you could go to. I mean, famously with him, supposedly he had family time. He just had no friends. He did it that way. He did it like he sure. spent time with like, his kids and his wife, but they would never like, the joke is if you were his friend, you never met him. He was always off to the gym and then you see you for five minutes, basically. And if you asked him, like, you want to come and have a beer? He'd be like, well, no, I'm retired. I'm still playing. Like, why would I have a Friday off? I'm going to be better. So basically what people don't get is what they want, like you're saying, is they do what they think a normal life should be, but then they take by definition an extraordinary person and <laughs> apply it to them. And so I'm with you. I I think it's nonsense. Like, they are, like, if you notice, it's why the most bullshit framing ever is when a fan of a sport goes, I, he seems like a guy you'd like to have a beer with. Every great player is the person who not only wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have a beer with them, no, they terrible. wouldn't have a beer with you <laughs> because that's not the life they live. They are the most elitist ivory tower people. By the way, remember, they have to like find a way to get off, Monty, on the idea that even the second best player in the world can't ever be allowed to be as good as them, even though he's amazing as well, one of the best of all time. They're like battling history itself. I even think that's the part people miss. The greatest players aren't even beating their rivals. They're trying to beat the best in history, so they're remembered as the all time career like the guy with the 10 rings or the 15 mvps or whatever so to me this is actually something upcoming on our lfn culture channel we have a film we're gonna which uh, i think we just released it actually it was like a week ago the one a phantom thread yes that film is basically about this topic it's yes. about a guy that you're gonna watch it and for the first half you're gonna go what a prick why would anyone like this guy say like, then you don't get it because that whole guy's thing is about the idea he knows the exact formula for him to be at his best to be a 10 out of 10 and to be the best in the world 
world at what he does. And the problem is, you're right. It would be totally unreasonable. And you know what? You would never want to be this guy's girlfriend or one of the people yes. in his life. You'd hate it. In fact, yeah. the joke is, even he maybe hates his own life on some <laughs> yes. level. But I'll tell you what, he knows that that's what you have to do and sacrifice to accomplish yep. what he accomplishes, which is to be the best. So no, I'm with you. Because I've seen it happen so many times. I've mentioned this in the past, where people like Steve Jobs, the obvious Monday examples, Elon Musk, everyone's whole take is like, no, oh, but I don't like this about their personality. And it's like, the joke is they've given up their personality to be the best at what they do. Like their, their whole thing isn't like, oh, if everything works out and everyone's happy and mentally sound, then we can accomplish. No, no, their thing is this, Monty. I'm going to accomplish X no matter what. Yeah. No matter what. And, the, and a lot of people parrot that and go, I'll do anything to win. And it's like, no, no, you'll only win if well, it's exactly comfortable I, how look, you want it to be. I, I understand why people are angry at this ad. Like, I don't agree with it. You know, I look at this ad, Thorne, and I think, wow, that's really actually, like, inspirational and, like, a really cool message. Like, I was vibing sure. all over the place. This fucking ad, I was, I was actually really surprised they made it. Um, but I was very happy with it. Um, but, you know, they, they always say, like, you know, just showing up is 50% of success. Like th the bar is set so low for most people that they can't even regularly do something on a long timeline to improve their life or to reach their goals. That's literally like when we talk to people and people are like Monty and Thorin, how do I get involved in esports? I'm like, just like do the thing until it works. Like you just have to like consistency and just showing the fuck up. And you will get there eventually. It may take a long time. It may take years. But the more effort and the more consistent you are with it, that's true of anything. So imagine people who have a battle to do something consistently, to even show the fuck up. And then they see this ad where it's like winning isn't for everyone, which is like that's the next level of showing up, right? That's showing up every fucking moment of every day of your life. And so the number of people who can do that are very, very small, very small. Um and you don't have to do that. I think that's the weird message, Thor. And it's like, just recognize that some people are built different. And like, just because you're obsessed with this thing and you reach the pinnacle of this excellence, does it mean you're a well-rounded person? No. Does it mean you're probably kind of crazy? Yup. Are these people really interesting to hang out with? No. Most of the time in my experience, like, I hate hanging out with these people. Like, they're actually just very boring. There's a story like this that you'll like, Monty. Supposedly, back when they had, I'm going to guess it was in the 60s, I'm trying to think of the era, there was a, there was actually like a, a chess tournament where it was like Bobby Fischer and a couple of the other like all-time great players. And it was something like, I think it was something mad, Monty. Like, I'm going to guess, I think, I think I've got the time frame right, so I think I'm referencing the right stuff. I think it was something like the Cuban Missile Crisis was happening or something, right? And everyone at the time was like gathered around the TV. Oh, what's going on? What do you think is going to happen with Russia? What's going to... And supposedly, Bobby Fisher just stood up at one point and went, what does it have to do with chess? <laughs> yeah. If you don't get that, you'll never understand what we're talking about. Because yeah. that's the point. You wouldn't want to have a beer with Bobby Fisher. It'd be boring as fuck. And by the way, he wouldn't want to have a beer with you. But the point, I think I can connect it to, I think what the real issue is here, Monty, is that people can't accept, well, they used to be able to in society, that we had things like holy men, mystics who go off and live in the woods for decades. And, they, and it's a totally alien life to you and me. But the idea is we don't judge it because it's not us. That's their path and not ours. Our path is to be a family and maybe man they do something exist in cool, society. Or like we can admire them in some way or appreciate or they bring us wisdom or they bring us extraordinary deeds, right? And the rest of us get to appreciate that because of their dedication. Well, we can't do that culture. But here's anymore. the problem. Now we have to baby people. I think when people, <laughs> when people react to this this video, what they're actually saying is, I judge this lifestyle and consider, or mindset and yes. consider it inappropriate. It's, it's not about you and yours. It's, no one's telling you to adopt that. What they're yes. telling you is if you reveal greatness, and remember Nike's in theory, this is also why people are stupid, Monty. The entire ethos of Nike was the opposite. It's only winning matters. Yeah. That was the entire point. So yeah. their whole point is, look, you can buy the Nike shoe because you want the, the best shoe, but you're actually revering the athlete. You're not revering that you're the winner. You're just a guy buying a fucking I mean, tennis shoe. So I, I think that people have the missed name, the whole point on this one. They're the name of the brand, Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. <laughs> like, they're literally worshipping the 
fucking avatar of winning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what? <laughs> it's crazy. And by the way, I'd even say you could even make an argument. This is why most people in life aren't cut out to win or be the best or at the top of any dominance hierarchy, Monty, because here's the difference. If you want to make a really, really like cynical argument and say, well, is it worth giving up your friends and your family to play basketball at the best level? I would agree and go, no, obviously, look, I wouldn't choose that. I would rather have a career where you could be really good and you can have both, right? But sure. if you understand that sports are a proxy for war, in war, if you don't win, you die. Yeah. There is no you either you either go to the limit and win or you die. There is no well, I came second, but I have a good paycheck and my family are enjoying our trip to Aruba. Like, no, you're dead. Like there's a reason why it's very extreme. And the problem we have is, yeah, these things seem I've got a great story I can give you very briefly, right? Because I actually saw this uh earlier today and I've bookmarked it so I can very quickly pull up the bookmark, which is there was a story I saw today I was going to tell you about because it's from the Olympics and it's perfect for this moment here because this is about someone who's American and everyone who reads this news article is going to go, what? But if you don't get it, you'll never know why Americans will never in the modern day be the best, but why, for example, Koreans will always be the shit at League of Legends. So here's the story. It's about someone called Lily Zhang, who's an American uh, ping pong player, right? Table tennis. And <laughs> yeah, the story goes... <laughs> She's a four-time Olympian. Her parents want her to get a real job. And then you go, what? And it goes, Lily Zhang is the most decorated American ever in her Olympic sport. Even she can't escape parental pressure. Being a ping-pong athlete is not stable, is what her parents say. Then it later goes, if she played at a high level, it would help her to get into a good school, said Lou, her mother. And then he ready. Later on, it goes, at age 16, she competed at the 2012 London Games. Though she lost her first match, her parents parents declared it a resounding victory. They're like, okay, you got to the Olympics, you got that on your college apps, and now you can focus on studies. She mostly quit table tennis after that, basically skipped forwards. And at the end, uh, even though she remembers, she goes on to be the most decorated ever in ping pong. Her mother at the end of this thing just says, you already went to the London Olympics. That is enough. <laughs> like, if you don't get how, like, basically, you all, like, they, they only accept being the absolute best. It's insane. It's insane. I know. I love it. I fucking love it. <laughs> I saw that story too. It's, I, 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 had a, it. I had a good laugh. I had a good laugh. Um, Yeah. Especially with the knowledge that, too, if she had actually been able to practice, like, she probably could have been even better than oh, she was. Of course, was. yeah. <laughs> she, like, actually being inhibited. <laughs> no, because by that, logically, I mean, you assume she was off doing other things, like, round out her fucking college resume, you know, like, in of some course. fucking <laughs> soup kitchen that her mom made to go to, where she should be grinding on table tennis. Studying I also. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love it's it. pretty funny. Anyway, I thought the ad was very good. I was really surprised Nike made it. I was very happy was Nike made it. Um, I that even looks, by the way, like the type of. Um, don't worry, I'm going to start them up soon. We're about to hire the people. That looks like those short videos that I want to make. The kind I like yeah, to yeah. do, where you, it's a little philosophical. Oh, yeah. I knew you'd vibe with this. It's one. a little quee or something, you know. Yeah, I was surprised I you was hadn't great. seen it actually, um, because it, it's been a lot of people talking about it. All right, final question, guys. Not a question, oh, okay, but a reminder to everyone that it could have been double lift on Team Liquid this season. <laughs> That's true. I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> Lord knows how much he would have underperformed against Guma at Esports World Cup based Dodo for blocking that from happening. That's actually a great callback. I forgot about that. It also is low-key based because the idea that this Team Liquid actually looks like it might end up being one of the best NA teams ever to play League of Legends is yes. also sick because remember Doublelift did try and dunk on them because the Dodo guy didn't sign him when it was in the yes. spring split. He did try to like shit on him. So it would just be such a great come up and for Doublelift, wouldn't it? I know. In I mean, many ways, the point is NA North American culture has moved beyond the need for a double lift. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> we don't need it anymore. You know, also, I mean, we did. Cre credit to Yun too, because Yun really did have a very good glow up uh, during the the Korean boot camp at MSI, and like the performance has been really good since. Like they should have beaten T1 at Esports World Cup. Like they should have just like Team Liquid unironically could have won Esports World Cup. And yes, it was a bullshit yeah. tournament, but. Even like Team Liquid, even winning a bullshit tournament is a big story, right? That's a big thing for them. Oh, uh, they right. continue to look really good, I think, domestically in LCS. Um, so, I mean, it's a very well coached roster, I would say, and like the players are stepping up, and the meta's been good for them. So, these are all the factors. But that is a that is a very funny callback to the uh, the the double lift uh, crying about how he should have been on Team Liquid, I guess. So. Turns out uh, maybe Dodo was a good GM. Well, by the way, what <laughs> I'll do on contrary. this one is 
I'll link it here, but for this one, we're going to address it on a future episode. I've got some more double lift material. You'll watch this for the next one. He okay. tells a mad story. Because the other thing about double lift is this, Monty. He does that thing, which is like another weird Zuma Gen Alpha thing, where you know they'll they themselves for clout will farm their own like moments of absolute like mockery and when they like were at their worst, they will farm it. And you know the saying people say is like, look, bro, you couldn't get some like KGB fucking agent in the cold water pry that information out of me and make me upload it. So Double F's done his usual thing where he tells an anecdote where he's the moron in the anecdote. Like he tells a story basically about how he doesn't lock the door every time he goes out of his house. And then Lena's going, have you locked the door? And he's like, well, you would go... You'll just have to, it's only a few minutes long. We'll address it in a future episode, but it has to be seen to be believed. It's another one of those double ones where you're like, is this a real person? Is this an act? Is this some Andy <laughs> Kaufman genius fucking, you know, thing where you're just playing a character for method acting style for 10 years? Because I can't <laughs> believe this guy's real. It's so mad. Right. It's so mad. I'll check it out. All right, guys. Uh, that's it for SI this week. We'll be back next week uh, to talk about Tons of stuff. Not LEC anymore in the dumpster fire that it was, but LCK, LCS, start of LPL playoffs. We'll be back then. See ya.